Oh, you know what I love? Sports. I love sports. Sports, 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 sports. When it comes to Texas A&M. Where are you getting this information? Let me tell you. Welcome to Texas. I need to talk a little sports with you, Ags. David Nunez here with Texags Radio. Billy Lucci here on Texags Radio. Olin Buchanan. We will develop men. We will graduate players. And we will win championships on the field. The best way for us to win is to do it together. Do you realize everybody knows who you are right now? I think we're coming into this year with a new confidence. Schools are like, we're freaking Texas A&M, man. Like... That's about as cool you throw-catch combo as there is. I saw the safety roll, the slot fade. I knew where I needed to put the ball. You had no other option but one hand at that yeah, point. Yeah, man, 50-50 right? ball, I gotta come down with it. You know, if I'm betting on anybody, it's the Aggies. All right, so one thing I can guarantee you is that I do not like driving across the country on these long road trips. But yesterday, even though we had at least an hour delay, Olin Buchanan, it was a uh, it was a nice drive. I enjoyed the conversation with you and Katie Smith, and uh, I'm happy to say that we are live here in Memphis, Tennessee. Welcome into Tech Sags Radio. We are presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. It is uh, the Rollo Insurance Studio of our hotel here in downtown Memphis, and this is the Go Hour presented by The Warehouse at CC Creations. And one more for you, OB. This Texags Roadshow brought to you by Alpha Paving. Alpha Paving, an award-winning paving contractor serving Texas, ready to deliver excellent customer service, meticulous project management, and quality workmanship for all your asphalt and concrete needs. Their projects include retail, office, multifamily, industrial for notable clients such as the Dallas Cowboys, HEB, Graystar. Visit them at alphapaving.com and let them get to work for you. And the reason I like them so much is? Uh, They're sponsoring us. Well, yeah, that's a big reason, (laughs) huge. But my good friend, and I say this, and he actually is a legit good friend, Brandon Leone is heading up the uh, Dallas office out there. And our good friend, Justin Lanham, who's in the office or in the studio with us right now, works for them as well, our basketball analyst who will be on the show a little bit later. So uh, great people when you need uh, some concrete needs out there. Make sure you reach out. The state of Arkansas ought to probably be, uh, the highway department ought to be getting in touch with them. Yeah, (laughs) no no doubt. (laughs) Be careful. Just kidding. So uh, give uh, Brandon a shout out there. OB, we're here. It's... uh, a lot of Nebraska red I've seen, especially in this hotel. Last night when we were walking, we were walking. What is this? This is in downtown, but it's got an area name. Right? What is it called? Uh, downtown. I call it downtown. Yeah, downtown. I. It felt like, I told you, 6th Street at 3 a.m., right? Because you could tell there had been some action, but it had cleared out by the time we got out there at 9 p.m. Uh, it was a Wednesday night. I mean, how much action can you expect on Wednesday night? Right. right. A lot of action, buddy. Oh, okay. Hey, now. <laughs> but in, in Memphis, downtown Memphis on a Wednesday night outside, you know, that, yeah, there was, there was some activity stirring, but, and we saw some, uh, we saw some pretty good activity. Some activity. Yeah. <laughs> pretty good. But for the most part, it was, uh, it was subdued. Yeah. It was subdued. So I got to give, uh, Luke Evangelist some props. He's the one who lets me know what people predict out there. Okay. One of my favorite comedians, Burt Kreischer, the machine. You probably don't know anything don't know. about that. He is he's the somewhat overweight comedian who does comedy without a shirt on. You've you've had to have seen oh, him. Oh, I'm glad I haven't. Oh, dude, you would love the machine story about the rough Russian mafia when he was at Florida State. You would love that story. I, I might, I might. Yeah. Well, he's picking A and M in the Final Four. Oh, so now you love him. He and Stephen A. Stephen A. Two of the most brilliant basketball minds our generation has ever seen. Two comedians. Oh, <laughs> yes. Uh, one is actually really funny, though. The other, not so much. But, uh, yeah, so we got another one. All right. Well, you know, I hope they're right. Well, the reason I bring it up is because it's not that far-fetched, OB. No. What What is A&M? What seed are they? They are a nine seed. Do you remember, and I know you do, a nine seed last year made it to the final four. That would be Florida Atlantic. Atlantic a team that AM played right down to the wire without two starters this year. That's correct. That is correct. So uh that that look, they got a lot of work. Nebraska's gonna I I did this last year and I'll you'll start seeing it happen on the air. I go from optimistic David to pessimistic David. I'm used to it. Back to optimistic David, right? And in my research last night, you saw me, I was re um, 
Vegas does not like A&M in this game. A lot of the places that I keep going to, not only are they picking them, they're giving these reasons. And I'm like, that makes sense. But does it? Well, you know, what, what, you were reading me a, a report, and someone was saying, you know, A&M uh, shoots, they, they rely on the three-point shot uh, so much, and yet they only shoot this and yep. this percent. And that, that's all true. But that's all true if you're looking at the stats today and you're just looking at, you know, the compiled season stats. Right. And that may end up being a problem. But if you look at the stats in the last six games, and is shooting about 40% from three points. Yep. So do you go with what they've done over the entire year, or do you look at what they've done coming into the tournament? Or, you know, are, have they made some changes that have uh, obviously benefited, or are they just hot? So, um, you know, you can analyze it and punch numbers and do all those things all day long. Um, and, and and the exact opposite of what you expect can happen. Case in point, last year, I thought all the numbers and everything looked really good for AM against Penn State. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. So uh, Nebraska, four and seven against quad one teams. I forget what AM's final number was. I think it's seven and six. Okay. Seven and six is better than four and seven. Well, yeah, seven is more than four, as, as <laughs> Matt works. Recall, yes. Uh, so that that's one of those. The Cornhuskers, 0 oh and seven all time. In the NCAA tournament. True. Buzz Williams? Well, 0 and 1 at, at A&M. Texas AM. Right. So he he needs one. But he's previously had some success. Yeah, he's had a lot of success. Yeah. But at AM. Um, he, and that's all we really care about, right? Yeah. That's I I care that Nebraska continues to lose in the in the yes, tournament. We would like that. I actually spoke with a couple of Nebraska fans before the show. They were in the lobby when I was setting up today. One guy was telling me that uh, we got a good one in Trev Albert. All right. He told me some things that, you know, they would have liked to have seen more from Trev, but he said, you got a good one. He's, he's going to be great for you all. He also uh, mentioned to me, you know, how, how fans do this. Like, well, you guys are really good rebounding and we're not. I like how you kind of lowered your head to, to listen. Like I'll give yeah, you a secret. That's a secret. Um, but yeah, he, he said, we're not really good at rebounding. You guys are, well, but. But they're like 15th in the country in defensive rebound. Right. So, so they're okay. <laughs> I mean, it can't be too bad. Right. Uh, <laughs> Here, here's one, and I'll probably ask Justin uh, this later on on the program, but uh, they are, let's see if I can find this number, um, something about their defensive efficiency. Uh, so they're, they're very good defensive efficiency. I would like to, to get a little bit, there we go, 15th in the nation, defensive efficient field goal percentage. And what does that mean? That's why I need Justin Lanham for that. He'll, he'll, he'll have to Google that for us out there. Um, so, look, there's a couple of things. Our uh, Ethan Jones, who does stats for us, also has some stats for us. Manny Obaski. Manny, Mo. Is he, he's not the reason they got hot at the end of the season, but he is a catalyst and a reason. He is a major factor in, yes, because he scored in double figures in every, every each of the last six games, I believe, maybe seven. And uh, what do you know? A&M is what? Five and two in those things. So in his uh, final six games, averaging 29 minutes a game, before that, 10.7. Well, he's been much more productive, so he's earned more playing yep. time. Points. He hasn't just doubled it, OB. Yeah. He hasn't just tripled it. Oh. Well, yeah, he, he's done more than that. He's averaging uh, 11 more points a game, 15.8 to his uh, previous percentage throughout the season, 4.2. Yeah, I think in the last six games, he scored more points than he had like in the previous 17 combined or something like that. 100%. Uh, point, so I gave you points. Field goal percentage is up by 14%. Three-point percentage during the season. He wasn't terrible. He was 30%. Now, 53.0. Oh, I know. I can remember. Uh, which game was it? Um, I can't remember which game it was, but he surprised me. The way he was shooting three. Yeah, I think it was the first Ole Miss game. I think it was. Not the first first Ole Miss, but the first right. recently. The, the last one. At the Fat Rats three. regular season game. All right, here's another one. Um, with Manny Obaski in the starting lineup, A&M's uh, guards have been a, a huge threat. In the final six games, Taylor Radford Obaski averaging 54.2 points per game and 9.7 assists per game. It's a lot. So what you're saying is their M.O. is Mo. And he's productive. Give the camera the, the look you gave me. That was good. That's their, their MO. Here's a little bit more for you to consider. 
Nebraska's offense versus A&M's defense. There's uh, Nebraska's solo offensive team with the greatest strength coming off from behind the three-point line. Nebraska averaging 77.6 per game, ranking 73rd in the nation, while A&M only allows 70.8 uh, points per game, 138th. Nebraska takes a whopping 26.4 three-pointers per game, hitting 36% of the Moby. So you're going to come out on them. Are you going to adjust your, your defense? Well, that's the question, right? Because A&M, it feels to me, they like when teams take a bunch of threes. You got to have them take threes that are rushed and not in their rhythm, but they like it. And But that also, in many cases, becomes their Achilles heel. Um, yeah, it, you know, it was the case against Florida. Yep. There's been other games where they've gotten lit up from the three-point line. And then, of course, we always go back to that NCAA tournament last year against uh, Penn State when Penn State just rained three points on them. Right. So, um, but I don't know because I haven't seen Nebraska play, but it, the numbers kind of suggest then that Nebraska doesn't have the overwhelming inside presence. No. So you can afford perhaps to extend your defense out to – uh, to change and adjust and maybe put more pressure out on the three-point. A&M's best offense, to me, is not when they get hot at three, although that opens a lot of things up, right? Uh, it's when they attack the rim. I agree. Nebraska limits opponents to 30% of their shots near the rim, 13th lowest in the nation. Now, is that because, for whatever reason, teams – They've been playing – that they're really good. They don't block a lot of shots. Is that because they're just really good inside, or is it because teams just shoot more threes on them or whatever? Well, we're going to have a Nebraska insider here shortly, so we'll we'll certainly have to ask him about that. All right, so uh, we're setting the table here. It is Texas Radio. We are presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. If you want to be a part of the conversation, uh, you can do it multiple ways. You can call us up, 979-693-1150, 979 979- Nine six nine three eleven fifty, or you can text us at that same number nine seven nine six nine three one one five zero. Can we go around another room and say hello to the people? Let's do it. Let's let's say hello to everybody back in College Station. So let's go to uh, behind the glass where we find Nick Savage. Nick, good morning, buddy. Howdy, good morning, y'all. Behind the How computer glass today. I'm good. I'm good. How are y'all? How was the drive? Uh, Up and down. I mean, I enjoyed the conversation. Poor Katie had to hear OB and I, two old guys, talk about old guy things. What was the best uh, song that was played, do you think? The best song? Oh, I'll let OB decide that. What, the best song? Yeah. For the whole trip? Yeah. Oh, gosh. See, if I would have been thinking about it. Um, there were a couple of uh, Ryan Bigham songs that OB was like, I yeah. kind of like this. Yeah. The Parker uh, McCollum song, Burn It Down. I think you liked that one. Played some Alan Jackson. I did play some Alan but Jackson. I'm going to say, I'm going to say. I did this. not play Bad Bunny at all. He did. I'm going to say this. The best song I heard, and you know, I know she's listening, was uh, Write This Down by George Strait. Great song. I pointed out that that was the song that I asked my wife to dance to for our first dance the night I met her. Yeah. So, yes, that was that was the uh, that was the best, the song. best song. And there was a moment, a brief moment, where I did play Joe Rogan in the car, and I was like, I felt that there was too many F bombs being said on that right. interview with Kid Rocks. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to go back to country music. No, that, that was a good song, too. <laughs> that was a very good song. <laughs> Nick, uh, what else is going on over there, buddy? Oh, nothing much. Just looking forward to hopefully weather permitting, uh, the Aggies can can get their game in tonight with Mississippi State Thursday through yep. Saturday series. Uh, looking forward to it. Again, got to gotta capitalize when you get the the good SEC teams at home, and I think the, the Aggies are in good position to do so with Prager on the mound. But again, Weather permitting, hopefully they can they can get that game in tonight. So the forecast is for rain. Is that right, Nick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, oh, thank you, thank you for the answer. Uh, so we did not get to watch the game yesterday. We were catch. I was catching it on the thread and on on Twitter. Five run eighth inning. Ob finding a way. That's all I care. Like I know Braden Montgomery did not pitch great. That's you know they pulled him pretty quickly, uh, but he hit, did hit a home run. Uh, Jace had a couple. Two. And I think the team overall had four. Is that right? Yeah, Koffer. Had, had Max Koffer, yeah. Koffer. So, um, again, I don't get too worked up or celebratory about a midweek. Yeah. You know, you're just not putting your best arms out there and whatnot. And I still believe that your your opponent on those midweek games typically come in more motivated not saying that you're not motivated and don't want to win, but I think, you know, say hey, we have a chance for validation against these guys. Validation. 
Yeah. Hey, let's go to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. Caitlin Torn is in the house. Aggies gather at the Angry Elephant. Caitlin, well, hello. Hi, good morning. What's going on? Nothing much. Uh, it's a little weird being alone in here today, but all it's good. So qu quiet, right? It is quiet. Kind of nice. Um, oh, we've got some stuff. How rude going. was that? Oh, no, no, nice. No, I mean, y'all. Usually we have good chit chat. We do, we do. But I don't know. Sometimes it's good to have a little quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Um, What's going on? We've got our we've got a couple NCAA championships coming up across Aggieland. The equestrian team is actually hosting it at the Thomas G. Hildebrand Equine Complex on the 29th and 30th. And AM is coming in as a one seed. We've got Georgia as the two seed, Auburn as the three seed, and South Carolina as the four seed. Um, hoping to come up with that one. The women's swimming and diving team opened up the NCAA championship with the top 16 finish in the 800 uh, free relay to claim honorable mention All-American accolades at the Gabriel Sin Auditorium on Wednesday night. And J.C. Roddick earns his second consecutive SEC Player of the Week honor. He's the first Aggie to ever get it in back-to-back -back weeks. Awesome. Good stuff there, Caitlin. Appreciate that. As a reminder, if you want to text the show, you can certainly do that. Um, that number, 979-693-1150. Mike, 1998 says, uh, it's loading up very slowly. I see it saying, ah, Beale Street, Godspeed, gentlemen. Is that where we are? Not yet. That's where we're going to go. We're, we're near Beale Street. Where were we? go down to B.B. King's. Where are we going to do, do our keg stand at? That's what I'm curious about. Um, there's any number of places. All right. Um, there was a place I can't, I could find it, but I couldn't tell you what it was called. Maybe it'll be at BB King's. Maybe at BB King's. Yeah. Maybe Jerry Lawler's barbecue. I feel did, we didn't go there, did we? When we were here last. No. Yeah. We'd walked by it, I believe. We walked by it on our way to rendezvous. Yeah. All right. Let's hit a break. When we come back on Texags Radio, can we talk a little football? It's always, it's a bad, there, there's never a bad time to talk about college football. Especially the Aggies. Yes. Look, we're going to be talking a lot of basketball, but we got some college football to get into. We've got spring day interviews starting today. Spring, sorry, spring practice interviews starting. So we'll get into that, plus uh, some other football topics like the 2025 schedule. Yeah. Which is hard for me, like, because I'm thinking 24 because it's coming, but then I got to think way ahead. Well, I would think that would be pretty good, easy for you next year, Nuno. Ah, look at you. But I'm thinking about this year, Nuno. This year, Nuno. Until the first loss. Then I'm <laughs> next year, Nuno. All right, let's hit a break. Uh, 12 under 12 time. Did you or someone you know graduate from Texas A&M in the last 12 years? Are you leading by example in business and in service? If that is the case, the Association of Former Students wants to invite you to nominate yourself or someone you know for the 12 under 12 young alumni spotlight. So every year. The association recognizes a dozen Aggies who have graduated within the last 12 years for their business accomplishments, civic or military service, philanthropic efforts, and outstanding representation of A&M's core values, excellence, integrity, leadership, loyalty, respect, and selfless service. So previous year honorees have included leaders in business and higher education, architects, petroleum engineers, nonprofit executives, physicians and veterans, and members of the U.S. Armed Forces. 2024 nominations close Sunday, March 31st, so be sure to submit a nomination soon. To learn more about that recognition, submit a nomination, visit tx.ag slash 12 under 12 nominations. Again, that is tx.ag slash 12 under 12 nominations. It is the Association of Former Students.
United States, baby. No country music. I, I, this song was on my playlist. You saw yeah, it. That's that, that's why I mentioned it. Yep. It's um. It, it's uh. I, I think I've just I've become more well rounded. Ob. Instead of just listening to one genre, I believe listen to three. I think country music is a very uh, underappreciated genre that's actually gaining some traction lately. Well, but it's gaining traction for the reasons that you would not like. Like, yeah, you got country true. singers doing pop music. But as people that are starting to delve into it that hadn't before, and they start discovering like outlaw country and right. Chris Stapleton and, and George Strait, people let them say, oh, you know, where's this been my whole life? By the way, speaking of countries, you know, I'm really impressed about. Nebraska, because you talk about an international team. They've gone to several other countries to get their players. They got they got all these foreigners. They got guys from Japan. Hop on. A guy from Netherlands. Yeah. One from Senegal. Wow, they got that too. Yeah, two from New Jersey. Hey, did you know the name of the show is Tex Radio? I did know that. Yeah. Did you know that uh, it's sponsored by David Gardner's Jewelers? It's our presenting sponsor. I know that too. And even though we're not, and in they'll Col- go to all kinds of countries. Oh yeah, you the jewelry that Heck you yeah. Need. And even though we're not in College Station, this is still the Rollo Insurance Studio. Rollo, wherever we are, is where Rollo right. is. So where and, Rollo is, is, where we are. And we're going this hour. It's called the Go Hour, presented by we're the going. Warehouse at CC Create. We'll go anywhere. We will. And this road show, yeah, presented by Alpha Paving. The Alpha of of paving. Yeah, they 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 pave, and they're alphas when they do it. Yeah. Alpha Energy. You feel the that? Alpha and the Omega. Of yeah, they are. they are. Um, and by the way, if you want to be part of the conversation, you can do it. 979-693-1150. OB, let's talk about that 2025 mm. schedule. No Bama, no Georgia. Mm, okay. I would say not a bad home schedule. I mean, we're so far away and, you know, rosters change, you know, in a day. But uh, here's what you got at home. Auburn. Okay. Florida. Low. All right. Uh, Mississippi State. Mississippi State. I'm missing one. Who am I missing? I only have three written down here. Away, Arkansas, okay. LSU, Missouri, and Missouri? Texas. All right. <clears throat> I mean, if Missouri continues being one of these top Was well, that Arkansas game going to still be in Dallas? This says, no, I think this it's is. It's actually. It, wait, uh, is this the last year? of? I th- I'm pretty sure this is the last year of Dallas. Fairly sure. Hmm. It started in 14. I thought it was a 10 year deal, but then they have to pay one back because of the COVID year. Oh, maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. Uh, I should know this. Nick, there's can... going to be a lot of driving that, that year. Yeah. They um, are in, Nick, do a little research. In 2025, they will be in Fayetteville. Oh, okay. that's what I thought. Okay. I All right. There you go. So, you think they'll make us drive to Fayetteville? Why did you say it's it out there? Uh, <laughs> bro, <laughs> uh, how far is Fayetteville? Six hours? Five hours? Uh, it's probably closer than than Memphis. Yeah, 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 yeah. Probably. So you ruined it. Hopefully, they forget that we're discussing. I know it. we'll be driving to LSU. We'll be driving to Texas. Look, you can't use one year as a barometer for what a roster is going to look like the next year or the no. year after, right? But you can look at program tradition and where they're trending. Is Missouri still going to be one of those teams? They're supposed to be really good this year. They got a bulk of their team. I'm not sure who's coming back just that without the transfer portal aspect yeah, of it, right? right? Uh, but I would hope their arrows pointing down. I would hope Texas is going to be around, right? That's going to be the Arch Manning year, probably. Yeah. All right. LSU is LSU. They're always going to be good. And Arkansas will probably be under a new head coach. That's my prediction. I would agree with that. But, you know, here's the only thing I disagree with you about that. Okay. About what you said is that you were – did you say something like you would hope that Missouri would be down? Yeah. Yeah, see, that that doesn't <clears throat> – I want to get to that point, and I think Mike Elko by, by then, maybe even this year. You're speaking for the fan base right now. It doesn't even matter how good the other team is because I'm just better. I want to beat you be- even though you're good. I don't want to win because you're bad. I want to win just because I'm better. Yes. But that, is that the most David Nuno thing yeah, ever to say? I was going to say, like, you, you took my line. But yes, you're correct. But I'm also a worrier. You are. All right. And I worry a lot up until game day, or actually up until the first. Then I'm all in until one bad thing happens. <laughs> and it, it, we could be up 35 to seven. 
and they score a field goal like, uh-oh, now, I mean, let's do the math. 25 points, that's not that bad. Like, they can do that. They can do that, you know, touchdown a quarter. or no. You are pessimistic with a lead and, and optimistic with a deficit. <laughs> I'm a weirdo. It's, it's okay. Uh, but considering you don't have the powerhouses that are Georgia and Alabama, considering Texas has not arrived to that level, Missouri certainly has not arrived to that level. I don't love that all those games are on the road, but whatever. Like, go take care of it. Do you uh, do you like that Texas and LSU seem to be on the same cycle for Texas A and M? Like, when it's away for one, it's going to be away for the other, mm-hmm. and home for one, home for the other. I've heard about you know some getting on the same cycle, and uh, I think it's it's fine with uh, LSU and Texas being on, on that same cycle. Yeah, I don't know how to respond to that. I'm I'm thinking that's fine. I I mean, I wouldn't care if you had to play one in Austin, one at home, and or one in away. Back to what you were saying earlier, though. You want it to be where we don't have to worry about worrying, right? Like it's just like A and M is this level better than you, right? And you know what? I think, I think Mike Elko. I'm very. Cautiously optimistic, as you should be. As uh, again, I got to be like that Missouri guy. You got to show me now. But from all the things we've been hearing um, about the dysfunction of the previous staff, mm-hmm. and yet AM was still so close to having a big year. Yeah. That you bring me in a coach that's going to clean up all that dysfunction and get everything on the same page and everything. Then I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that they can, that they can really have a strong season or you know and by why i 100 percent agree i'm 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 just going to give you a different perspective of that bad teams are typically in games so like the fact that they were in these games we look at that as a good thing but bad teams are in games like very like five and seven and seven and five teams have a chance in the fourth quarter all the time and they lose and they lose because yeah so so what what changes you to become that team that that fades in the second half, or that team that flourishes in the second half. What's the change? Well, to me, where's okay, that start? Here, here's here's the Goggins in me. You follow the level of your training, and if discipline was an issue, mm-hmm. all indications. Anaya said it the other day. We, yeah, we hear it <laughs> when your best player or one of your best players actually actually acknowledges it. You know th- that speaks volumes, doesn't it? Yeah. So if discipline is taken care of, and Focus was an issue, right? Because to to me, if you fade at the end, are you are you really dialed in for all sixty minutes, right? Like you might be. I don't know because it might be the talent. But we've read, seen talent. And here's another thing: development. We need to see development. And I am the most optimistic because there's a change at the offensive line, right? Yeah. Not necessarily with the players. There is a, a little bit of a change there, but with the way they're going to be coached. I agree with that. I think they needed a different messaging. And I just think that there's a diff- there's going to be, at least I'm cautiously optimistic, that there's just going to be a different attitude, mentality. You know, let's say a guy, I don't, you know, let, let's say a guy came in and said, you know, coach, um, I got a Charlie horse. Or, and it'll be a lot better if I can get a better NIL deal. Okay. Bye. So yeah. the- Go to Oregon. I, I, know, I know you can't necessarily have that you we're in a different era i get it but the, and when going back to your comment about my team i just want my team to be better than yours that's what i need for my offensive line and defensive line by the way yeah i want real nasty guys on it you gotta be smart play yeah. offensive line but you gotta be kind of nasty too you gotta eat and eat off the bone yeah arr. Uh, like that's a, arr. there you go sound like a pirate <laughs> arr. let's uh, hit a break when we come back we're going to talk to a nebraska insider and find out all these things we've read about them and, and some of the highlights we've watched, like, you know, should A&M be worried? We'll talk to them. We're not going to be worried because we're going to be better than them, OB. I think we should be worried. But just because you well, concerned. You should be prepared. You should be prepared. Yeah. You should understand. Do not underestimate this opponent like you might have done last year. Yeah, we're preppers, right? We get ready. We stock the food. We got it all. And the shoes at the Brazos uh, Running Company. You know, they're located at Century Square. <laughs> <laughs> 
That was a terrible segue. I mean, it worked. I need yeah. to go there, by the way. I need yeah, you do. Shoes. You know, uh, they'll take care of you. They're great. Uh, I mean, they're fantastic. Locally owned, Aggie owned and operated, specialty running store with the best selection of running gear. You've got all the shoes you need right there, including uh, Brooks, on those. Hoka. Sorry? Need those Brooks. I've yeah. good things. Brooks are great. Hoka's great. New Balance? You like those? Yeah. I'm, uh, I don't have very much balance, but maybe that would help me. Yeah. That's Get a new balance. E- equilibrium problem. If you're a runner, walker, or interested in any fitness at all, the right shoe makes all the difference. And a company, a running company, they're going to be very passionate about running and taking care of you and finding that right shoe for you. They'll put you through. the left shoe? Is that going to be a good one as well? They're, they, You know, they match them. They do. <laughs> okay. Yeah. They, they point at different areas, but they, they, they match them. Especially with me. Birkenstock, they got Viore there. I love Viore. Remember, it's a uh, the place to go when you need your uh, running gear, your athletic gear. Brazos Running Company, located at Century Square, below the Star Cinema Grill in College Station. Take me to the other side, OB. Ryan Bingham, that's my guy right there. Yeah, I like that. I, uh, I, I, I was made familiar with him because of Yellowstone. And yesterday, you saw me. I was watching Longmire. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm in. Walter Longmire, that sheriff Walt. of Wyoming. I know him as Walt. Walt, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Tex Ags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. It's the Go Hour presented by the Warehouse at CC Creations. This Tex Ags Roadshow is brought to you by Alpha Paving. 
They're an award-winning paving contractor serving Texas, and our, our good friend Brandon Leone and Justin Lanham have uh, the headquarters there in Dallas. Let's talk a little bit about Nebraska OB. They're a team that we have uh, not watched a lot of, but we're starting to catch up, and certain things on uh, film make me, uh, you know, as I get very pessimistic and optimistic all in the same 24-hour period. Let's let's talk to an insider, excuse me. Robin Washett is their uh, senior team writer for Husker Online on the On3 Network, plus uh, you can catch him on KETV. Robin, good morning. How are you, bud? Doing well. How are you guys? Doing well, man. So let, let's start things off with Fred Hoiberg. Obviously, many of us are familiar from his playing days, coaching days in, in the NBA. Uh, I believe this is year number five for him. Yep. Why has it taken this long for the team to kind of find that secret magic? Well, it's uh, kind of a layered answer there because when Fred first came uh, in 2019-20, he basically tried to copy and paste the same formula he used at Iowa State where you basically reset the roster through the transfer portal, uh, bring in a bunch of just really talented players and kind of hope that they come together and mesh as one. Well, it did not work whatsoever. And, and in 1920, that was before the immediate eligibility with the portal. So they brought in all these transfers and most of them, at least the good ones, had to sit out right away. So they had these guys that were just kind of trying to get through that year one. And then year two was the COVID year. So that threw everything off uh, with, with all of that. And then 21-20, it was kind of the same deal where they just there was zero chemistry, zero culture. It was kind of just like a bunch of mercenaries together that were all kind of in it for their own individual purposes. And so they had talented players, but it was nowhere near being a, a quality team at least, and certainly not one that was able to compete at the Big Ten level. So that off season, following the 21-22 season, Fred had a kind of a, a come to Jesus moment where he kind of realized that I got to change things up with my approach. And a lot of that came down to recruiting different types of players. They 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 restructured their staff, um, kind of the guy that was in charge of their roster management. He was let go. He's now at St. John's now. And they, they brought in a staff that was defensive oriented. Um, and then they went and started recruiting guys that weren't, I mean, they were talented, but they weren't necessarily just focusing on talent. They were first focusing on guys that were like high character, team oriented players, veteran players, and uh, low maintenance players. And they were able to do that with that first class. And um, you go back a year ago, there was a trio, um, Derek Walker, who ironically was in that first recruiting class Fred had when he got here was one of the sit out transfers. But then they brought in a kid uh, from Lincoln, Nebraska, um, that transfer from North Dakota State named Sam Greasel, and then an SMU transfer um, from Emmanuel Bandamel. And those three guys, you know, that they only finished 500 um, two years ago, but just the improvement of the quality of play and more importantly, the culture within the program really took off. And then going into this past off season, they were finally able to build upon a foundation that was already in place. They returned a good core, and then they were able to supplement that with guys like Bryce Williams from uh, Charlotte, uh, Rink Mast from Bradley, uh, Josiah Alec from New Mexico. And so they, they've really kind of taken a, a significant step, both on the court with their level of talent and just the, the, the cohesiveness they have as a team. But like I said, most importantly, it's been about the culture and having the right players who are about the right things in place to kind of set the tone from the top to the bottom. Well, tell me some more about this and, and for, forgive me for butchering the name. I'm probably going to butcher it, but Casey Tomin, Tominaga. Tominaga. Um, Tominaga. Where do they find this guy? And <laughs> you know, what's, you know, what's the story behind him? So he, uh, you know, obviously he's from Japan and uh, he was wanting to come stateside. And, you know, the 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 staffer, Matt Abdelmasi, who um, was let go during that kind of pivotal transition period a couple of years ago, he had a connection with uh, Kese's father. And so when he decided, was looking around, you know, they knew about Fred's offensive oriented system and figured it would be a good place for him to go just because of the relationships and the style of play that would be conducive to his skill set, but he wasn't a qualifier. So he had to go the junior college route and end up going down to Ranger Community College down in Texas, where Billy Gillespie at the time was the head coach. And so the relationship there, they picked Ranger because Doc Sadler was on Nebraska staff and he and, and Billy Clyde go way back. And so they they had a good situation there. Well, then Billy leaves and they get a new coach there. So Casey had to spend two years at JUCO. Um, so he was he didn't join the team until 21, I believe. Uh, and 
it took him some some time to adapt. You know, he was a he's a slender guy, shorter. You know, defense really wasn't his strong point, but he could always shoot it. And so he kind of played spot minutes off the bench his first year, and then last year uh, it was kind of the same deal for the first part of the year. But then injuries happened, and you know, um, Manuel Bandamel got hurt. That was the big one, and they just didn't have a lot of scoring punch with their lineup towards the second half of the season well Casey all of a sudden starts playing extended minutes and you see that when he gets into a groove uh, it's it's really hard to slow him down and he caught fire towards the end uh of last season and had one of the most impressive months of February uh into March as anybody in the conference and so uh, they were able to retain him he flirted with the NBA for a little bit and maybe even going back to playing professionally in Japan but his decision to come back was probably their biggest concern going into the offseason, just because they knew what type of player he could be. He is far and away the biggest X factor they have on the roster. And you go back a couple nights, um, that opening game in the Big Ten tournament against Indiana on Friday night, that's exactly why. You know, he that was the type of performance that he's been doing really all year. But that was the, the biggest stage that he's done that uh, to date. And he kind of captured everybody's imagination with that. Where like Pat McAfee's talking about him now, you know, he's he's kind of becoming a a bit of a a national talking point going into the tournament. Inconsistency is a little bit of an issue with him, you know, especially defensively. There there have been teams that have exploited his defensive liability to where it kind of counters out what he brings offensively, but. More often than not, you know, he's going to be a 15 to 20 point game guy. He's got two 30 point efforts this year. And when he gets hot, like I said, I mean, as soon as he crosses half court, you got to guard him because he will shoot it from from 30 feet. And and more often than not, he has the green light to make it. Robin, I feel like this game is going to be what team does what they do best better. And I know that's most games, but this one, it seems like what A&M is good at Nebraska might struggle with and what Nebraska is good at A&M may struggle with. I saw this stat out there that they're limiting 30% of their shots. Uh, Nebraska's defense um, with, uh, by the rim, near the rim, 13th lowest in the nation. What about their defense and what makes that part of their defense effective? Yeah, they run kind of a unique baseline trap style of defense to where they don't, they want to take away everything under the basket and in the paint. And they're, uh, at times, it's worked perfectly. Um, you know, they, they've they've really, like you said, been able to protect the rim. And a lot of that is because they don't have a true rim protector. Like, they, they just don't have that big, you know, shot blocking five. They got guys that can block shots, but that's not their strength. And so to compensate for that, especially, you know, when you're playing the Zach Edies of the world uh, in the Big Ten, they've kind of had to be able to, to, to find new ways to protect the rim. And they do that by making sure the ball never gets there. Now, the flip side to that is they leave themselves vulnerable on the perimeter a lot. And good three-point shooting teams have uh, been able to have a lot of success with them. But um, that's kind of their style. They, Whenever the ball gets to the baseline, they they swarm and double team and make sure that the ball goes back out. They, they refuse to let the ball get inside the paint um, for, for easy one-on-one matchups at the rim. And a lot of that, again, is just because of their um, lack of a true shot blocker and rim protector. But they've also kind of made it into a, a bit of an advantage where teams don't see that a lot. And so that they kind of force them into mistakes. They jump passing lanes a lot. So when they do get trapped on the baseline, they try to kick it out. You got guys um, you know, with, with a lot of length that are jumping passes and creating turnovers. So um, I think a lot of the issue is that it's just a, a style of defense teams don't see very often. And it, it's caused some problems, especially the first time uh, they uh, opponents experience it. So um, um, if if A and M is able to somewhat contain, somewhat contain uh, the the what are they call the Japanese Steph, Steph Curry, Curry, yeah, right. If, uh, so so then how does how does uh, Nebraska uh, contain Wade Taylor? No, no. How do they come back? How do they uh, uh, adjust? I mean, who do they go to next, and how do they score if you're if you're uh, preoccupied, if your defense is preoccupied, opponent's defense is preoccupied with, uh, and I'm already going to mess up his name again, uh, so Tomaga. Kase. 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 Yeah, there you go. Uh, <laughs> so that's kind of the uh, one of the benefits of this lineup for them is, you know, Kase is their leading scorer, and he's, you know, by far the, the best game changer they have on the roster. But, you know, he's only averaging 
you know, 14, 15 points per game right now. And uh, they, don't, they don't have a single player inside the, the top 25 in the Big Ten in scoring, but they have five or six guys that can lead them in scoring on any given night. So they, the, the versatility they have offensively is something they pride themselves on. Um, you know, Rink Mass, uh, the center, like I talked about, he he had 34 against Ohio State. Um, you know, Bryce Williams, he's had multiple 20 point efforts. Uh, he's 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 an interesting guy in that he was recruited as a wing, um, had never really played point guard before. But um, Nebraska didn't have a true point guard on their roster. And a lot of that is because uh, they had a kid, Aaron Euless, a transfer from Iowa, who was ruled ineligible during that Iowa gambling investigation. And so they were kind of left without a true point guard. And so uh, about midway through the season, Bryce Williams shifted over to that lead guard role, and he's really flourished uh, ever since. And so that gives them kind of a 6'7", 215-pound point guard uh, who can do a lot of different things. Uh, so he's right at the top of, you know, you want to make a list of their best players. k is probably their best score. I'd make the case Bryce Williams is, is their best player just because of everything he does and the importance of the role that he plays. Rink Mass is right in there, like I said, because he's a he's a 6'11 big that shoots, you know, upwards to 35% from three-point range. And so he's able to lure opposing bigs out onto the perimeter, which creates a lot of open space. And Kese with his three-point shooting lures defenses out to create a lot of different spacing. And so the ripple effect, if if teams focus on Kese or they focus on rink, uh, they, Nebraska has other guys that can exploit uh, the, the matchups that are created by the attention those two guys get. So um, that's, it, it's hard to say like, who's the next option. Those guys are certainly at the top of the list, but um, you know, they got a guy, CJ Wilcher. He's their six man. He's, he's had multiple 20 point efforts, uh, off the bench this year and was in consideration for the big 10, six man of the year. So, um, it's, it's not one or two guys that you shut down. And then all of a sudden Nebraska's offense falls apart. They have several guys that can step up on any given night, which is probably one of the biggest differences between this team and really any team Fred Hoiberg has had here. Rob, I've got about 30 seconds left. What was the stat you, t- you were telling me about uh, Nebraska's defense, or excuse me, rebounding? It was like, like, I think 15th in the country in defensive rebounding. So I keep reading that they're not good at rebounding team, but they're 15th in the country at defensive rebound. So are they a good de- rebounding team or not? I'm sorry, Robin. Yeah, no, they're that's that's their weakness. Um, teams that rebound, especially who crash the offensive glass, have given them a lot of problems. Go back to the last time they played against Illinois. Illinois is the number one re- offensive rebounding team in the Big Ten. And they were plus eight and second chance points in a nine point win. And that was the difference when, when Illinois erased a double digit victory or a double digit deficit at halftime, it was because they were the aggressors on the glass. And so when you look at what AM does, that's the number one thing that scares Nebraska is their physicality and their relentlessness on the offensive glass. Robin, great stuff, man. Appreciate it. Uh, we'll talk to you at some point. All right. Yeah. Thanks for having me guys. Thank you. Thank you very much there. Ron wash it. Um, bringing it from a Nebraska point of view. All right, we got to hit a break here. We'll come back. Got some closing thoughts for the go hour before we start our interview with Schloss and Bronny. That and more is Texas Radio.
Obi, uh, I told you earlier that I'm a Ryan Bingham guy. Yeah. But his new album, Nick, how would you describe it? Atrocious? Like, I think that's being like electric polite. pop. It's, it's not, not really. Good. There's a reason I'm bringing this up. But am I right about that, Nick? That's correct. Yeah, it's not, not very good. It's not what I'm used to listening to in my, you know, 20 years or 12 months or <laughs> of listening. But the reason I bring it up is because it looks like, uh, the University of Texas is trying to take a page from Texas A&M. Uh, their collective is hosting a concert at DKR May 18th with Brooks and Dunn and Ryan Bingham and the Texas gentleman performing um, to try to raise some NIL funds. And I'm just saying, good, because Bingham, who I like a lot, his old stuff, probably that style probably needs to be at DKR while we'll just keep uh, the king with us. Yes, uh, I think George Strait, as much as I'm a fan of Brooks and Dunn, I think George Strait. Trumps both of those. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, hey, it's Texas Radio. We are presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Alpha Paving is bringing you this road show, Go, uh, go Hour, coming to a close, brought to you by uh, the warehouse at CC Creations. Final thoughts on what you learned about Nebraska? Uh, well, it sounds like they're deep, or at least they, they have a lot of score, scoring versatility, but it also sounds like they need to, uh, they need to make threes to win. Yeah. That, that, if, it sounds like that if they're not making uh, threes in a heavy volume, that that they're going to uh, struggle. So if you can get out and defend that three-point line, they're not a great rebounding team. They'll make them miss. And it looks like they try to get you, trap you early on to not allow, right. but they are vulnerable in transition buckets. Well, and I do wonder if that works the way A&M plays. They're going to walk it up and then isolate with Manny, isolate with uh, Boots. But I think they're at their best when they don't walk it up, when they push. Well, yeah, when they have that opportunity. But yeah. I'm saying when you get into that, that's what they're going to isolate. Mm-hmm. And uh, I wonder, I mean, if you're spreading out the floor and isolating one guy, does a, does a junk defense really become a bigger problem? I don't know. Maybe it does. Kasai, if he's covering Wade, I think he's going to be on skates for a while. Um, it sounds like defensively he struggles. And may he and, and if you switch up and Manny's on him, forget about it. All right, we have to hit a break. Thank you, brother. Bet. All right, when we come back on TechSags Radio, we'll talk to uh, Jim Schlossnagel and Ryan Broniger uh, as we continue our uh, coverage here from Memphis, Tennessee. It's TechSags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers.
All right, late rally yesterday. A&M does come back to win past Prairie View. Five runs in the eighth inning as Texas Ag's radio. We're presented by David Gardner's Jules Rollo Insurance Studio. And uh, this roadshow, this Texas Ag's roadshow, is presented by Alpha Paving. Appreciate uh, Brandon Leone and Justin Lanham hooking it up so we could be out here in Memphis, Tennessee. But we're going to go back to the uh, Rollo Insurance Studio in College Station. Ryan Broniger is there. He uh, saw the game last night as A&M did rally back, and he's going to talk with Coach Jim Schlossnagel as we pick up the hotline. We're joined by Coach Schloss. Schloss, how are you? Good morning, sir. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm doing well, just trying to keep the rain away. Yeah, coach, you often say that one of the biggest jobs of a, of a baseball coach is being a weatherman. So let me ask chief meteorologist Jim Schlossnagel what the what the plan is for today. <laughs> sit around and wait. Yeah, sit around and wait. Uh, hopefully, you know, the forecast I keep getting is there may be a window of time this evening for us to get the game in, and then there's big storms behind it. So if we feel like we have a two and a half or three hour window to get at least all or most of the A game in, um, then we will do everything we can to do it uh, to avoid, you know, doubleheader and having to play three games in 24 hours, essentially. Yeah. Speak to that schedule. It's just a little bit different, right? Whenever you have a, a Tuesday off and then you play on a Wednesday and, and I know you had no control over that Thursday game, but just your, your thoughts on the last probably 12 hours or so having to, Play. It was really weird last night being in the ballpark on the radio call, Coach, and, and you guys get off the field and into the locker room, and here comes Mississippi State into the first base dugout to get a workout in. Yeah, yeah, that was weird. Um, yeah, obviously, uh, you know, we signed that contract, I think, with Prairie View, or at least set it up. Um, and then and then the, the SEC TV schedule comes out so late, and we had requested to not have a game. Uh, Thursday series this weekend because of that Wednesday game, but but that request wasn't honored, which is fine. Um, so uh, yeah, it is what it is. I think you know again, uh, like I said last night, things happen for you, not to you. So the game, the way it went, um, playing all night innings, it uh, gave us a chance to get a guy like Isaac Morton in a game uh, when the game's in question, and he's got to you know throw strikes and do all that stuff. So I thought that was good, um, and. Uh, you know, we threw enough guys. I don't think we overtaxed anybody in particular to where they wouldn't be. Well, I know they. I know that the guys we want will be available this weekend, uh, and we didn't have to throw some of the guys that we would use, for example, in a game tonight. Yeah, I thought the biggest bright spot last night, when you look at back the totality of the game, was Isaac Morton. So, uh, kind of what 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 can his role be going forward if he's the guy that we've seen the last couple of outings? Well, I mean, I think you've heard me, I mean, just kind of moan and groan about uh, having, you know, some right-handed power arm strike throwers out of, especially out of the bullpen um, for the last two years, three years. And uh, he looked like that last night. Uh, Cortez has, you know, hopefully made a big jump to where he's going to be a little more consistent for us. And uh, he did that last weekend against an awesome Florida team. Uh, so that's good. That's two. That's two. Uh, that's two good right-handed arms. Uh, the flip side of that is uh, the guys that didn't travel and but pitched last night, or you know, they're still going to have to pitch. And uh, that that was the discouraging thing um, because as we put Cortez and and uh, Isaac available in the weekend, depending on how much they throw, uh, somebody still has to pitch the midweek games and. Um, we got a lot of guys around here that say they want to pitch. A lot of guys that complain when they're not on the travel roster, and then when they, you know, when they get the ball, uh, it's their time to shine. So, for us to put together a good overall season, uh, they're going to have to pitch better. The opportunity last night to get some guys in the game. It just talked to me through. I, I, I could I understand the catching decision to, to catch Coffer and give him some innings back there. But Jet Johnston gets to start in left field. What has he done in the midweek to to earn an opportunity there? Uh, you know, I think it's as much about the things Jet has earned. Uh, with, you know, he, he put together a good fall for us. He's had moments in the spring. Um, it's also, you know, some of the guys who have gotten opportunities haven't done a ton with them. Uh, and with Chestnut down, we're actually we're actually down some outfielders. You know, we, we, we don't really, there's not a, we have the three, you know, shot Montgomery and Lavalette, and then you have Sorrell. Um, 
And so your only other eligible and healthy outfielder is, is Jet. Uh, so we just need to get him at, we need to get him at bat. Um, we have a few infielders that could run out there if we needed them to, but you know, I don't want to give up defense. So, um, gave Jet a shot, uh, to get in there. They started a lefty, but, they, but we knew they would play a lot of different players. And I thought Jet did fine. You know, he chased one ball out of the zone there in the eighth inning. Um, but he hit two balls over 100 miles an hour, one of them like 104. They just happened to be out. He drew a walk. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, Jet, we really like Jet as a player. And, uh, so that was the opportunity to get him in there. And then, uh, Trying to keep you know, Appel off his feet as much as we can uh, when we get opportunities to do it. Um, Max hit a home run, uh, which has obviously helped. Uh, but uh, he knows he, I mean, Max Coffer's a better player than he showed last night. We saw that last year. So sometimes, you know, when guys do get their chance, they they over try. And, uh, yeah, but that's part of it. So I thought it was interesting uh, that those, yeah, were, yeah. those were two right handed yeah. hitters. And, and as you continue to kind of search for options in that DH role against left-handed starters. All those at-bats are important for those righties that when they get their shot, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, I don't know if Popper would ever DH, but you never know. Uh, but, yeah, one of those right-handers, one of those right-handed hitters is going to have to, uh, have to take it and run with it. Otherwise, we're going to you know, see if a guy like Hank can, can uh, handle the lefties, too. Hank always puts together really good at-bat uh, versus right or left-handed pitching, so. There's opportunities in there. Um, they just got to take advantage of them when they get them. What have you seen out of this Mississippi State club over the last few weeks? They've really caught in fire, and it seems like one big power output got, got in Dakota Jordan, but they, it seems to me, Coach, like it's kind of a similar offensive lineup to year one for you here in College Station where they just they just pass the baton to the next guy. Yeah, I'm sitting here looking at it. They have uh, they really struck out 139 times. And they've walked 132, and they've been hit 27 times. So they have more walks and hit batters than they do strikeouts. Um, and they've stolen 28 bases, with, or they stole yeah 28 for 31, uh, which is a great percentage. Uh, that's more running than maybe they've done in the past. Um, uh, and then you know Jordan is is super hot. He's a great player. Uh, he can. He knows the strike zone. He's got 11 homers, seven doubles. Uh, so, so 33 of his hits are, uh, or 18 of his 33 hits are extra bases. So, he's a uh, he's a future big leaguer, and um, we have a lot to deal with. And then pitching wise, they're even even though their number one starters out, uh, they're they're doing a much better job. They have a new pitching coach. He's doing a great job of kind of corralling all of that. Um, so it's a it's an Omaha caliber club. This is the Mississippi State of potentially the Mississippi State that won a national title. So I know they've been down. They're very motivated, and they're, and they're feeling really good about themselves. When I look at their pitching staff, coach, it's very versatile. You got the St. Jones Sunday, and everybody knows about him being both handed. And but they also have some guys that come out of the bullpen that offer up some different looks. And uh, you know, go back and watching their series against LSU, and it was a lot of high ride fastballs at the top of the zone. You know, how much do you go into a series kind of looking for trends and say, okay, this is what they've done in the past. Let's see if they're going to try to use that against us to be successful. Yeah, I mean, p- pitchers especially are – they are who they are, right? They're, they're not going to, like, go from sinking the ball to riding the ball. So, um, you know, we've been preparing um, – the, the, the one thing they all do is they throw hard, right? It's, it's super high-end velocity. Um, so we're going to have to do a good job of of uh, being above the baseball and swinging at strikes and, and taking the ball. If they don't walk that many people, um, the guy you mentioned, the switch pitcher guy, he's got, he leads the team in walks. But everybody else has very high strikeouts and very low walks. So and 247 strikeouts in the team and 83 walks. So uh, they're good. I mean, this is a really good team. And uh, rankings don't mean a single thing. Um, they can really pitch. They got right handers. They got left handers. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, they they've been recruiting off a national title for two years, so they should be good. When you look at their record, they haven't played a true road game yet. When you look at their schedule, excuse me, coach. What kind of impact can? And I said this last night on the broadcast. I I really I love fall Saturdays at Kyle Field. They're so much fun. But for me, as the baseball purist, there's nothing better than what's about to happen on Olsen Field in Bluebell Park with an SEC, the first SEC series of the year. So the, the crowds have been great. 
how much influence do you think they can have on these SEC series going forward, especially a team like State, who is hot, but they have not been on the road in a hostile atmosphere yet? Uh, yeah, it can always have an impact. I mean, I think every team in this every team in this league is used to that. Uh, even though it's their home stadium, uh, you know they have to deal with noise uh, when they're home. So yeah, the 12th man always has an impact. That's why I want this weather to get out of here, and we encourage everybody to get to the ballpark uh, because because they they do have a role um, in us winning the game. And this is a tough place to play when it's full and loud and people are on their feet. Um, you know, and so. There's no question. We just got to get everybody to the ballpark, hope this rain gets out of here, and cheer as loud as we can, and we'll do the best we can on the field. I did want to ask you before we let you get out of here about the double base at first yesterday. Just your overall thoughts, the reason behind its implementation, obviously a safety concern, but your thoughts on how it looked and how it played yesterday. I know there was one specific play in the seventh inning where I thought it was it, it made the most sense. Like That's exactly what – it was designed for was to keep the runner and the, and the guy covering the base completely separate. Yep, no doubt about it. And uh, you know, people, it, it it looks different, right? And baseball uh, traditionally has been a sport that is very hesitant to change, um, but it, it just totally makes sense. Uh, you, there's just so much safety. Just if you look at the average play, the distance between the first baseman and the runner, uh, there's a lot of distance. There's a lot of safety there. Um, all we did last night, you know, I'm a part of, um, I was the president of our coaches association is we're trying, uh, as a competition committee, we're trying to get this into our sport, uh, next year. And, um, so I thought it was just a good opportunity. Uh, it's a permissive rule. Uh, so you're allowed to do it anytime. We're not, I'm not going to do it this weekend. Um, but, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's easier on the umpire. We, we all know but baseball is a beautifully designed game with the exception of, the space between home plate and first base. It's, it's screwed up when you, you can't run in a straight line and be legal, and that makes no sense. So it's not fair to the umpire. It's not fair to the players. And I've had great players right-handed hitting first baseman in careers or seasons over there. So uh, hopefully we can get it passed. I wasn't trying to, you know, show off or do anything. I was trying to bring some awareness to what uh, we can do to make our sport better. All right, last thing we we'll let you get out of here, Coach. Uh Starting pitching this weekend, just uh, same rotation, but what are you expecting to see on a bounce back from from Ryan Prager and Tanner Jones? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm expecting to pitch better, uh, obviously, but uh, really interested to see the uh, you know the old saying: it, it, you can't control what happens to you, but you can control how you react to it. So we need to. Uh, I expect Ryan to be to do well. He's got he's got to get back his fastball command and get that good breaking ball going, but. Everything's on. Everything's on video. Everything, every single thing. And so, uh, this game is a uh, at our level and all the way to the big leagues. It's a, it's compensate and adjust. And we have to. We'll scout out Mississippi State and see if we can't figure out what they're got going on. And and they're going to see what Ryan and and Tanner do well and and what they haven't done well. And, and they'll try to uh, exploit that. So, uh, this is this is the major leagues of college baseball. So you better be ready to go. All right, Coach. Good luck this weekend, man. Appreciate you. All right. Thanks, buddy. See ya. That is All right, that was Jim Schlossnagel with uh, Ryan Broninger. Bronny, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I, I was going to close the segment. <laughs> this is weird because I'm looking at you on the TV. <laughs> I didn't know how we were going to communicate this after the interview. But we have do have some time before the break if you wanted to. You know, I just felt kind of – I didn't want to keep him for the whole 17 minutes. But we can, we can break early if you need to, or we can talk more baseball. No, listen, I, I do want to ask you, so uh, – I. I think you probably heard we weren't able to watch the game on the drive. We were driving yesterday. I was keeping up with uh, with the thread and on, and on Twitter. So from your perspective, um, the pitching recently, um, there's been some issues out there. Overall, I know you can't look at yesterday as a, as a, as a big deal. Braden got off to a, to a rough start. That being said, are you concerned with the way the pitching looked initially and to where they are right now? Uh, get back to me. You know, last night was – these midweek games for a lot of the, our tryouts, and Jim Schlossnagel has said that, like they're trying to see how deep they can go in the bullpen, and they walked the world last night. I think they walked nine, had an intentional walk, and hit a batter. Um, that's a recipe for disaster regardless of who's in the other dugout. Let me tell you this. The leadoff hitter for Prairie View A&M is a real player, and I don't know how they got him out of Pensacola, Florida. He's a freshman, 6'4", 
six foot three, two hundred and fifteen pounds. He looked like David Nuno walking in the batter's box. But and he hit a ball off the rec center on the fly, like four hundred and fifty six feet. Um, and so and he came up because AM really struggled throwing strikes to the bottom of the P V order. He was coming up in RBI opportunities. I think he drove in like five of their runs. Anyway, that was a huge problem last night was just throwing the ball in the strike zone that typically hasn't been an issue. You know, last weekend in Florida, they got beat up for throwing the ball in the middle of the plate too much, and they got punished to a, a Florida team that was really locked in. And you kind of look at what could happen this weekend. Mississippi State's as locked in offensively as Florida was, if not more so. Now, it's not the same raw power production, David, but it is a very much we're going to move the baseball, have tough at bats. Uh, they've got one – they've got two real power threats in my mind. They've got Dakota Jordan, who Coach Schlossnagel mentioned, leads the team in just about every offensive category. And they got a kid named Hunter Hines, who was preseason all at, first team All-SEC, who hasn't lived up to that billing quite yet, but there's plenty of potential still in there. So this is a Mississippi State team that may not bloody you with the double and the long ball – like Florida did. And also, look at this. With this weather moving through, we're going to have a couple of north wind days at Olsen Field. And so we know how the ballpark plays when, with those conditions, with those wind conditions. It, it makes it like a graveyard. So A&M can't rely on the long ball as much. And that kind of, I think that kind of actually plays into Mississippi State's hands. They don't hit a bunch of home runs. You know, they, they just kind of have good at bats and, and pass the – baton to the next hitter and put you in pressure field situations that's the way they do their offense so it's going to take a, a much better effort from the AM pitching staff starting pitching especially on Friday and Saturday or excuse me game one and game two and I think the offense is going to have to do a little bit of what we saw that helped them get rally late yesterday David be really good with two strikes this is a team they're going to strike out a lot. They've struck out a lot since Jim Schlossnagel is here, but you know what they've also done? They've walked a lot, and they've slugged a lot. So you don't really worry about the strikeout numbers if the, if the run outputs are still very good and very high. You start worrying about strikeout numbers if the walks don't, start, don't match them, and then you're missing those extra base hits that ultimately produce the runs and crooked number innings. So those are just areas I'm keeping an eye on this, this weekend is – can a and play against a team that is not going to try to sock it over the fence all the time? How do they pitch to them? And then offensively, can a and play a game where they can just hit low liners, flat balls? And the home runs will come off of that. They got guys with crazy power and Gavin, Jason, Braden. They'll still hit their homers. But can they play and win a series, this offense, with a stiff north wind in their face against a pitching staff like Jim Schlossnagel said, going to run it in there. They've got big-time power arms, a, and a bunch of them. They're, you're not going to see anybody throwing under 92, 93 for Mississippi State. They're all going to be big-time arms coming up on the mound. Ronnie, uh, I do want to close out with this quick question. How am I supposed to feel about this Otani news? Like, I, I'm only seeing the tweets, so I haven't really read the report out there, but just if you can give me a 30-second-minute version of well, how I should feel about because I'm seeing, like, Tweets that make you think one thing, but the report points a different way. So you, what did you take from everything? I, it's hard for me to imagine that Shohei wasn't aware of some of this stuff going on. And apparently they've got bank transactions from Otani to the bookie. And then I guess within that, the translator was involved in siphoning some of that money off. I don't know the ins and outs of it, but I don't think this is just going to be cut and dry. You know, the translator is going to take – take the fall here unless they're going to pay him off and say look you take the brunt of this you keep Shohei out of it and we just move on but if that guy if that translator wants to fight this it seems like this could get a little messy Ronnie I appreciate you buddy thanks for uh filling in there yesterday and doing the Schloss interview thank you all right man Ryan Broninger our baseball analyst and uh good buddy Instead of break here, we'll come back with AT a little earlier than usual. A moment for Caldwell Country Chevrolet, Highway 21 and Caldwell online. CaldwellCountryChevrolet.com. When you go to Caldwell Country Chevrolet, uh, you, you know you're going to get a great selection of vehicles, right? Like that's – the everybody's process is different. For, for us, we had to go through a whole like let's discuss what we need, what I want. I wanted a certain type of car. I wanted but, – but what do we need? So we went through that whole process, and we realized when you've got a 1,000 kids, do you need a bigger vehicle? So we got the Tahoe, right? 
and the Tahoe's been great for us. But uh, it was a process for us because we we knew a certain price point we wanted. We knew, you know, kind of a timing thing. And Caldwell Country was fantastic throughout that whole process. Uh, and, and thank you to them. They, they, they were so, so good. So we did it, right? Uh, Dylan took care of us there at Caldwell Country Chevrolet. And uh, we got the great trade-in value, a great price on our vehicle, and so much more. It's just a really pleasant experience when you go to Caldwell Country Chevrolet. And remember, it's not a far drive. We're talking 15 minutes, the very end of Brian to the beginnings of Caldwell. A short conversation away, but you'll see the difference when you step on the lot and do business with the great people. They're at Caldwell Country Chevrolet, Highway 21 in Caldwell, online, caldwellcountrychevrolet.com. All right, we're back here on Tech Radio. We are presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Um, and uh, this Tech Sags Roadshow is brought to you by Alpha Paving. Alpha Paving, an award-winning paving contract service in Texas, ready to deliver excellent customer service, meticulous project management. I love that word, meticulous. And quality workmanship for all your asphalt and concrete needs. Our projects include, and that would be theirs, retail, office, multifamily, industrial for notable clients such as the Dallas Cowboys, HEB, and Graystar. You can visit them at alphapaving.com and let them get to work for you. We're supposed to have AT on the show. Uh, AT last week. Nick, remind me. AT last week was too busy for us. He was in Las Vegas, correct? Yeah, he was at the Pac-12 tournament in Vegas, oh, okay. I so believe. He was doing real so, work. Okay. And I'm sure... And today, even though we texted back and forth yesterday about moving his hit to 920, 
missing an action. He's a busy. We're he, gonna do hey, about that. He's a busy man. You you give yeah, AT a hard time, but I love AT. AT's AT's one of my favorite guests. Whenever I co-host, uh, I enjoy talking to him. So hopefully we get him here. So what you're saying is you have favorites? Of course. All right. Who who, who is your favorite? I Probably Stephen McGee. Even though we booted yeah. him off the show today. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, he, he's, he's, he's my favorite by far. Yeah. I love Steven. Um, he, but I, was I supposed to say Billy? Cause he's my boss. I, I probably should I mean, have said that. I, but, but, but Billy's not a guess. Billy is, he's like, it's like OB. Like I know like when we put the tweet out or we, but OB is, he's not a guest. Like he's, show. He is yeah. my yeah, yeah, partner yeah. on this show. Uh, as, as Billy is obviously in a, in a different way. Um, but I'm trying to think, favorite guest. Who do I look for? Justin Lannon's pretty good. He's sitting right next to me to the left. So he's he's one of my favorites. Who else is out there? Hmm. I love Tom Schuberth. Yeah. I love Ryan Swope. Huh. Uh, you know who I liked a lot? Um, Mike Evans, my dear friend Mike Evans. Nice. He was really good. I wish I'm we're, upset we're, that we're, I missed that. We're pretty that. fortunate. Yeah, that's cool. I'm I'm uh I'm upset that I missed that. You, oh, you didn't listen to because you were busy. I was you at were Pro doing Day, stuff. yeah. I was at Pro Day. You were at Pro Day? I was at Pro Day. Yep. So I don't know how to feel about this. Look, not to make it a joke, because I'm, I'm, I don't mean this as a joke, but I have talked myself in and out of things often. But I'm, I'm a little concerned with the way Vegas, every site, bet, uh, MGM.com, DraftKings, all these sites are out there are picking Nebraska. And obviously, like the question is, when you're eight nine is such a toss up, right? Such a toss up. Nebraska's being favored by I think point and a half is the last I saw, but an article I read last night said that they expect that to go back to what the initial line was, which was two and a half, right? So my my thing is, have they played the caliber of teams A and M has had? No, because you can look at what they've done in quad one games. They're four and seven in quad one games, right? Um and what they're really good at does obviously draw an eyebrow. They're really good at shooting threes, and they do limit teams getting to the rim. What does A&M like to do? Uh, they like to get to the rim as much as possible. They do struggle giving up threes, and you know they got a gentleman in Tomi, Tominaga that uh, can hit a lot of threes, guys. And if you watch the, his highlights, he can, he can shoot them off balance. He can shoot them off a screen. He can shoot them with somebody in his face. He's got a great stroke, but... Um, to me, Vegas is usually on to something. I am not going to allow past failures or past you know, results to, to let me think that this is how this game will go. What I will do, though, is remind folks that this A&M team, um, yes, they were 500 in SEC play, but they were playing their best brand of basketball at the end of the year. Now, so is Nebraska. Nebraska's hot, man. They're scoring. I think... In the Big Ten tournament, they were averaging 89 points a game. So they're a very hot team. I get it. And they're a team that I think we do need to worry about. Um, but all that being said, uh, A&M, I believe, has the one thing that Nebraska will struggle with, and that is the athleticism and the ability to rebound on both ends of the floor. The fact that they are as athletic, and Manny Obaski changes the dynamic, if these guards try to, if, if Manny decides to post up one of these smaller guards, he's going to take them to the house. And if Dominaga struggles defensively and wades, you know, his when he puts really good defenders on skates, what is he going to do with somebody who's not a, a very good defender? So th those are storylines we will need to track. And when we talk to Justin Lanham here in a few minutes, we'll, uh, we'll get his thoughts on that. By the way, this is around college. Athletics, college basketball, brought to you by Millicom Reserve, a college station community featuring homes, trails, farms, and wide open spaces. They have a mission to build a healthy community around nature. Take part in the Millicom Reserve community with a conservancy membership. Learn more at millicomreserve.com. All right, now caller number one. We're going to give you a free car wash, Aggie Land Express car wash in South College Station off of William D. Fitch in Greensbury. They are Aggie owner and operated with a friendly staff and a personal touch. They offer a monthly membership. We're going to give the first caller a free car wash right now from Aggie Land Express. In South College Station, 979 
Well, Cheerio, welcome into Tech Radio. We are presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio here in Memphis, Tennessee at our hotel. I'm not going to tell the weirdos where we're at, but, I'll, you know, it's a good hotel. A great hotel. A little boutique That's Justin Lanham. He's from Alpha Paving, but more than that, he's our basketball analyst, and uh, he made the trip out here. Alpha Paving. Uh, is, is Leone treating you well? Leone's treating me great. Yeah. We always talk about Logan Lee being the nicest guy, but Leone's in that same conversation. He's pretty nice. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. The fact uh, that I get to work with him every day, I'm very fortunate. He He's a great leader. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, you can be honest now. He, he's not listening. <laughs> well, at you know, I mean, maybe I need a raise or something. I don't know. So every we've talked about it. It's been a theme on this show today, but I talk myself in and out of scenarios when it comes to my sports team, right? You just told me a second ago the same thing. You're like, I watched Nebraska on film, they're, they're pretty good. Yeah, no, they're, they're really good. Uh, you know, it's, it's, and they, they play a fun style of basketball, you know? Um, and so, um, as just a basketball junkie myself, you know, I, I enjoyed the, you know, the couple of games that I got to watch them play. So, uh, they're, they're really dynamic. So, and, and they've got a lot of really good players to, uh, you know, for us to have to figure out. Well, I, I did want to ask you because you were explaining it to me and I was still kind of confused about defensive efficiency. And it's basically, if I took away the right thing, it weighs the three-point percentage, what you give up more than the twos. And A&M gives up a lot of threes, and Nebraska makes a lot of threes. So how does that kind of equate to defensive efficiency in this matchup? Yeah, so, uh, you know, when you're factoring an effective field goal percentage, a lot of the times, you know, that's uh, not a lot of times it is. You're factoring in basically the three is valued more than the two. So, um, you know, if you're only shoot twos and you shoot 40% from, from the, from two, uh, your effective field goal percentage is going to be 40%. But as you start to shoot more threes, whether you make or miss, that's going to adjust your effective field goal percentage right. by quite a bit. So they, uh, you know, value the three point more than the two essentially. Yeah. Um, are you more worried about their ability to hit threes or are you worried about a &Ms? inability to match them scoring because this is a team that in the big 10 tournament scored 88 point or 88 points per game. Yeah. I think their ability to hit threes is, you know, just kind of alarming uh, for me, just the volume, the amount that they put up um, and um, just trying to guard them. Like I said, they, they run such good offense. Um, they're moving away from the ball. I think that's why I told you before uh, we came on here, you know, it's, it's fun to watch them play because uh, they're moving so much. They got a ton of action away from the ball. Um, you know, everybody's compared Tommy Naga to uh, Steph Curry, and it's true. When you watch him play, I mean, he there's, the way he releases too, right? Releases even like his floater in the lane. Yeah. Um, you know, getting to the basket and 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 things like that. So you know, he's he definitely uh, is kind of the college version of of Steph Curry, and so um, he's he's really fun to watch. He's very dynamic, and and um, when they beat Purdue earlier this year, that was one of the games that I wanted to go back and and watch, and so I did. And um, you know, he really gets them going. Um, they feed off of him. So if he hits a big shot, you know, he's going crazy, getting the crowd pumped up. And so um, if we can, you know, try to keep that to a minimum, you know, then uh, I think we have a good shot, but uh, he, he can, he can get going quick. Here's another factor. Uh, the fact that this is a veteran A&M team. And while Nebraska may be a veteran Nebraska team, they are newcomers to the NCAA tournament. They haven't been in the tournament since 2014. They have never won an NCAA tournament game. So how does that factor in, in this matchup? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a big deal. I think people talk all the time about NCAA tournament experience. Um, in fact, I was thinking about that when filling out my bracket with Gonzaga. Gonzaga's not uh, who they've been in the past, but they have so much experience in sure. the tournament. And so um, that's just kind of the same thing here with, with Nebraska, or really the opposite, is that, you know, Nebraska hasn't had that experience. But the thing that I that I would say that is kind of – that would go in their favor is <clears throat> when you look over at the sideline, Fred Hoiberg is so calm, his demeanor – that I think that that's going to carry them and can carry them in the NCAA tournament because he doesn't get rattled. And so when he doesn't get rattled, your team doesn't get rattled. I read an article that uh, was talking about Fred and, and how, you know, he had two seven win seasons, his first, first two seasons yeah. and everybody around Nebraska read an article that they said, everybody around Nebraska really appreciated the fact that you could talk to him and he just didn't seem rattled. He just felt like, Hey, we're going to, we're going to turn this around. And so I think that that goes a long way in the tournament when you have kind of that steady guy leading you. Two teams that did not match their preseason expectations. And what Nebraska was expected to finish 12th in the Big Ten. A&M, I forget what number, four, five, or three, in that range, right? Uh, maybe, maybe it was three. But they fell off. 
but they finished strong. Nebraska also finishing very strong. This is a, a Nebraska team that has overachieved, and they seem to be getting hot at the right time. Yeah, no, they are. And I wanted to briefly touch on that that uh, kind of point you made about them. You know, pick to to finish twelfth. It was pretty cool. I read another article that talked about Josiah Alec, uh, one of their players that transferred in from New Mexico. He was reading before he transferred. He was reading all the, the I guess, non-hype about Nebraska and saying that they were going to finish 12th. And he looked at their roster, and he realized, I think he maybe played a pickup game with them and realized, hey, I think this team can compete. And so that just speaks volumes of of them and their team, that they have confidence in themselves. And so they weren't reading, uh, you know, as, as Nick would say, Nick Saban would say, rat poison. You know, they're not worried about that stuff. So um, I think, uh, yeah, they're playing, they're playing uh, good at the, at the right time. And so I feel like they're kind of peaking right now. And so they're going to be a hot team. An area that we were struggling to understand uh, was the fact that they're 15th in the country at defensive rebounding, yet they're not a good rebounding team. I don't know what that means. <laughs> right. Like, like, cause you either a good rebounding team or you're not. Their stats say that they're good. But everybody tells you, well, they struggle with offensive rebounds, you know, uh, with teams that can offensive rebound well. So I, I guess the way I read it, Justin, is they haven't played a lot of teams that are very good offensive rebounding teams, which is why they're high. And when they take on teams that punch them in the mouth, they don't get to the boards. Is that, am I reading that correctly? Yeah, 100%. Um, you know, I think uh, it's, it's going to be a different different beast for them when they're playing, you know, us and as far as just kind of our SEC athleticism and our, uh, you know, ability to offensive rebound. Um, you know, they do have some guys, um, obviously inside that can defend and, and things like that. The rink mass kid, number 51 for them. Yep. Uh, he's six ten. you know, Tommy Naga is getting so much attention. The mass kids not getting much attention. And I think he might be one of their most dynamic players. Sure. Um, six ten inside, uh, averages 12.5 points per game. But he shoots a lot of threes, shoot right? a lot of threes. He's a pick and pop guy. So if Tommy Naga um, or one of their bigger guards is is in and he can he can pop off of them off of a screen, uh, he's really good at that. I thought it was really interesting. Uh, the second play of the game when they played Purdue, they pitch it inside to him and Zach Eady's guarding him, right? And he just turns over his left shoulder shoulder and hits a little hook shot. So he's got game from kind of everywhere. Um, he'll catch it at the high post and feed out of the high post. So he's really, I, I think he's the guy, honestly, he's, he's another guy that you really got to focus on and, and worry about. So going back to the rebounding piece of that, he can, he can rebound Josiah Alec. They've got some guys that can rebound, but I just don't think that they've seen uh, this SEC athleticism, that type of rebounding. I, I don't think they've seen it this year. I want to follow that track here in a moment, but I'm going to read you this uh, stat that I found. Uh, four of the team's six players who average more than 20 minutes per game shoot at least 36% from beyond the arc, and they take, obviously, a lot of the three-pointers, man. Yeah, absolutely. They've got C.J. Wilcher and Jamarcus Lawrence um, uh, that, that can come off the bench and and put up a, a ton of threes. Uh, Sam Hoiberg, uh, Fred Hoiberg's son, um, he, he can shoot the ball. He, his th- three you think? His, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe gets it from dad. His three-point percentage was better last year than it, than it was this year, but he's a very capable shooter. But um, their, their best three-point shooter... Uh, as far as percentage wise goes uh, for this year, Bryce Williams or uh, CJ Wilcher. Oh, okay. Yeah. He's shooting 39.7% from beyond the arc. He's taken 126 threes. So it's not, you know, he's, he's still putting up pretty, pretty decent volume there. Um, you know, he comes off the bench most of the time. So um, that just shows you how deep this team is. I mean, they got guys that can score. They got, uh, you know, six, seven guys that can really contribute. And so, one guy's not getting it done. There's multiple guys that can get it done. I forget the stat exactly, but it was about 54 points a game during this uh, Manny Obasiki stretch that you're you're getting from your three top uh, guards, if you want to call, consider Manny a guard there, with Wade, Manny, and Boots. Athletically, I think Nebraska's going to really struggle. Like, if Dominaga's out there, right? Yeah. Do I say it with a Spanish accent? Yeah, you I'm, do. You do a little bit. Yeah. yeah and I'm, so I, f- I feel bad. I feel like I'm not pronouncing it right. But, but I feel like if I try too hard to pronounce it the right way, uh-huh. like it, it, I don't, I don't want to try too hard. I'm just, Tominaga. Yeah. Tominaga. Yeah. Um, if he is not defensively, if he's not as good defensively, right, you can kind of negate him, right? If if you're putting him in scenarios where he's got to cover Manny, like if you put in some screens in there. I feel like that's going to be a huge – and it, by the way, I don't know if they have anybody that can cover Manny. When Manny is going to the rim with as as um, physical as he can be, that's going to be very difficult opening up weight, I think, in, in return. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and oh, boots, by the way, who can take anybody to the hole? Absolutely. You know, I, we're talking about Nebraska. I don't want to get on, you know, I don't want to, it's not doomsday. You know what I mean? I right. think, you know, you're just, just pointing out areas there. where they're good. Absolutely. Sure. Uh, you know, uh, Bryce Williams, though, is a big guard for them um, that, uh, that I think will probably match up on Manny, I would imagine. Um, <clears throat> they may have, uh, the other thing, too, is, uh, you know, Nebraska has shown a little bit of matchup zone. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they don't go to that against us and just say, hey, shoot it from outside um, and beat us beat us that way. So and they try to trap. Apparently, we talked to an insider at the half court, which, you know, they try to create a lot of turnovers there. But if you can get it past that, you have a free look at the lane. Yeah. And with our athleticism, if we can, you know, get it over the top of the top of the uh, that press or, the, or that trap there. Um, now you're playing. They're at Nebraska's at a disadvantage, and mm-hmm. and that's what you want. And and uh, I know Buzz and them practice that daily, uh, being playing against a disadvantage. So, um, but uh, yeah, you know, Nebraska as far as uh, defensively, I think you do have to take advantage of some of those mismatches. You know, if that's Tommy Naga, wh- whoever that is that you feel that mismatch is, um, I do think that they don't switch a whole lot uh, defensively. So um, I do think that they're probably going to just hard hedge or trap, like you said, or even maybe a little drop coverage on some of this ball screens because I know we're going to ISO into a ball screen. And so I know that they're going to probably not switch on that because they're not going to want to get somebody into a mismatch. I'm going to read this to you. I found this on BetMGM. Uh, Wade Taylor may be averaging four more points than Tominaga, but has done it on 179 more field goal attempts. Taylor could outscore Tominaga by five points in the first round, but if it takes 10 extra shots for him to do it, that could hurt AM more than it helps. Actually, I don't know if you, the guy who wrote this has seen AM because that's kind of their form. I'm not saying that Wade missing, but like AM scores a lot of points on the putbacks. Yep. So I'm okay with that number if Dominaga is efficient, if we're getting the offensive rebounds, which I'm fairly sure AM will be able to do. If we are crashing the boards, you know, then obviously that formula works in our favor. Um, if we're just shooting ourselves out of the game, you know, that's a, and not getting those rebounds, that's, you know, that's a different story. But uh, yeah, you know, uh, the interesting thing about um, Tommy Naga and Wade is I, I feel like they are able to hit kind of off balance shots at times. Um, I, you know, I think I heard you talking earlier about Tommy Naga, about how good he is coming off screens and just turning and he doesn't need much space. That's oh. what's scary about him. You, you're going to have to pick him on uh, almost full court, you know, pick him up on the other free throw line uh, because you, you don't want him getting any space whatsoever. I'll be interested to see, you know, a lot of times we do our little three quarter court press mm-hmm. and, and I'll be interested to see if we get into that. I, I would imagine we don't just because we don't want to give him much space at all. Um, so you want to stay attached to him. It's c- crucial when a guy like that is such a lethal shooter. You got to stay in his pocket. You always got to be trailing him off of screens. I'm watching him come off a of screen that he's so good at reading whether the guy's coming over the top or whether he's coming underneath. He's going to curl if he comes underneath. If he goes over the top, he's going to flare out to the to the corner. And so he's really he's really good. He picks his spots, but he doesn't need much space to get it off. When we come back, I want to ask you about AM's defense because I think reputation is there a very good defensive team? Sure. And are they a good defensive? I mean, they are good. Sure. But are they elite defensively? I want to get your thoughts on, about that when we come back here on Sex Ax Radio. This is brought to you by Alpha Paving. They're our road sponsor here. That's why we're able to do this great show there. So thank you to uh, Alpha Paving. We'll head a break. We'll come back with more here on Tex Ax Radio.
Well, it is Texas Radio. We are presented by David Gardner's Jewelers, Rollo Insurance Studio, Justin Lanham with me from Alpha Paving. By the way, who who, who brought us this uh, roadshow? Uh, Alpha Paving did. That's, and and we have a friend that's kind of running the show in Dallas. Yeah, our, our Mr. Prez, uh, Brandon Leone. Is that his title? That's his title. Does it say Mr. Prez with a Z or does it say president? I think his LinkedIn says Mr. Prez with a Z. Oh, wow. That's, <laughs> uh, that's below average, but awesome at the same time. We love Brandon. Brandon, you should have made the trip with us. We would have talked some hoops with you in basketball. That's all right. You owe us uh, another one. When we make, ah, uh, if the Aggies, if, if they beat Nebraska and if they beat the University of Houston, who is a little banged up, by the way. That's right. Then we go to the Sweet 16 in where? The uh, FW. That's right. That's right. I've been trying to get Brandon to make us a Texas studio in the DFW. Right, I have one in Houston, my parents' uh, office. Right, I did bring this. Yeah, we need one in, in the DFW. Come on, I asked AM by reputation because all Buzz Williams teams are going to be hustle teams, get after it every play. Right, defensively, especially with Dexter Dennis last year, but defensively, are they a good defensive team? Are they elite defensively? Are they good ish? I would say just above good, whatever that is. Is that good-ish to you? Good-ish. Yeah, good-ish. Okay. Um, you know, I, I thought, I think I said this last, uh, on Tuesday, um, I thought in the in the SEC tournament, I feel like our defense kind of picked up. We started to turn teams over a little bit more. Um, you know, maybe sped them up. I don't feel like necessarily we were doing a ton, like a ton different, but I felt like we were just playing more. And again, I think it was because our back was against the wall, you know? And yep. so, um here's the deal in the NCAA tournament in a sense, everybody's backs against the wall, you lose and you're sure. out, you know? So um, I'm hoping that they kind of bring some of that, um, what they had in the, in the SEC tournament over um, to the NCAA tournament. So uh, play with just a sense of urgency. If, if when, when a does that, I think we're really good and I think we're hard to beat. Um, so just got to play kind of chip on your shoulder with a sense of urgency. All right, here's one. Randall Salado says, I feel like buzz needs to win tomorrow for the trajectory of the program. What do you guys think? Before you answer that, uh, Nebraska needs their first win. Yep. Buzz has not had an NCAA tournament win. This is year five. It is needed. Uh, if they do get it, it doesn't erase everything that happened this year. Right. It sure makes it a lot better, to, uh, easier to swallow. Yeah, it does. You know, and I think uh, year five, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Year five, you know, I think... Um, you, you just, you need, you need that win. You need that NCAA yeah. tournament win um, just to kind of show that you're building, you know, you've played uh, in uh, multiple SEC championship games. Um, you've um, got to the NCAA tournament. Now you're back at the NCAA tournament tournament, but now the next step is to win a game. Yeah. And I think, um, I think you can get this win against Nebraska. Again, I know we were talking earlier quite a bit about Nebraska and, and probably seemed like we were hyping them up, and, and they're really good. I don't want to take anything away from them, but I do think that we are very capable of beating this Nebraska team. I think good teams take on the image of their coach, and this A&M team certainly takes on the uh, the image of Buzz the way he wants basketball teams to do. But you can say the same thing about Nebraska and Fred Hoiberg. Yeah, absolutely. Um <laughs> the the mayor right uh fred got the got the nickname the mayor whenever he was uh there at iowa state and so um he's uh like i said his his demeanor i think is kind of what uh what this team you know i think is is really good about this team is just you know kind of their demeanor and how they carry themselves and like i said when when tomi naga kind of gets going he gets the rest of them going so um i wanted to point this out too about uh, Fred Hoiberg. Um, I had this in my notes. He is so good at ATOs after timeouts mm -hmm. coming up with a really good set and a really good play. Um, uh, they'll put Tommy Naga into a, into a little screening action. Like he'll set a back pick. They will throw lobs to guys because you can't help off of Tommy Naga. Yep. And so, man, he's, he's really good. That's something I think buzz and them will have to be aware of. It's just ATOs. Anytime there's a dead ball, or there's a timeout or a free throw. There's probably going to be a little set coming. Yeah, um, and let's kind of quickly, we have, I think, about two minutes left, um, and Nick will tell me if I'm wrong. The backstory of Dominago, we kind of hit it before, but he's got you know ties to, to Billy Gillespie at Ranger, but just uh, w what have you learned about him in your research? Yeah, I thought that was pretty interesting, you know, that he played at, uh, he played there at, at Ranger. Um, I thought that was really cool. Uh, played for Billy Gillespie. Um, Doc Sadler, uh, the assistant at Nebraska, um, I think got him there. Um, and then obviously, um, Doc Sadler is actually not the assistant there at Nebraska anymore, but he kind of got him to Ranger. Um, and then with the, uh, 
just kind of knowing, hey, after he leaves Ranger, he's going to come over here to Nebraska. And so uh, Billy got to Billy Gillespie got to coach him for a year there at Ranger. I think it was the COVID year. And then the next year, Larry Brown, not the not the Larry Brown that coached Allen Iverson, but uh, a well-respected high school basketball coach and college basketball coach um, took over there at Ranger Junior College and got to coach him uh, in his second year there. And I believe he uh, uh, has the record for three point makes at Ranger Junior College in his in his sophomore year. And again, just to remind people, that's kind of an Achilles heel for A&M is giving up three point shots. But again, they want teams to do it. I don't know if they're going to want this team to do it in about 15 seconds or less. No, absolutely not. Um, obviously, you don't you don't want any points at the at the rim, easy buckets. But uh, you definitely have to guard the three point line. And uh, you know, I, I don't think that we can switch a lot. I think we got to stay in Tommy Naga's pocket and uh, keep him off the three point line. Join me again at the uh, 1050 spot whenever we close out the show after Billy, and then uh, we'll we'll see you at the rewind as well. All right. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. That's Justin Lanham. When we come back on Texas Radio, it's the Battle of the Nice Guys. Logan Lee is going to be on here after Justin. We go from super nice to extremely nice, all in the uh, same hour span there. So we'll get to Logan, get his thoughts. You are listening to Texas Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. Thanks to Alpha Paving for bringing us this road show.
Welcome back in Texags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. It is the uh, Texags Roadshow, brought to you by Alpha Paving. They're an award-winning paving contracting uh, service here in Texas, ready to deliver excellent customer service, meticulous project management, and quality workmanship for all of your asphalt and concrete needs. Their projects include retail, office, multifamily, industrial for notable clients, such as the Dallas Cowboys, HEB, and Graystar. Visit them at alphapaving.com and let them get to work for you. We're here in Memphis, Tennessee, as uh, we're getting ready for, we have shoot around in a little bit, or a practice shoot around, and of course, press conferences with Buzz and the guys. Let's go to the hotline. We're joined by Logan Lee. Logan, good morning, buddy. Good morning, David. How are you doing? I'm good. So I only heard part of the story. Are we allowed to talk about your outfit? Yeah, you talk about my outfit. This is a good outfit. Look at this. Qual- I don't know, quality. I don't know how many people are actually watching, but this is a this is a blue Texas A&M basketball shirt. Blue blood. But, but there's are, a story behind it. Yeah, I, I wore it last Thursday when I was on the show because uh, it was actually the first time that I wore it. And I feel like A&M did decently well in the conference tournament. So I figured why not wear it today? And hopefully A&M can get two wins, maybe more in the tournament. And we'll see what happens. I'm going to start you off with a, a sports take question. So I asked Justin Lanham a minute ago. I'm going to ask you, is AM an elite defensive team this year? Are they a good defensive team or a goodish defensive team? I think they're good. I don't think they're elite. I think they're good. Uh, but what I, I do think that they are, they have the possibility to be elite on the offensive end, which is different than, than last season uh, and the seasons before. And so they don't have to be elite on defense every given night, but I, I do feel like they have to be elite on offense. They're going to have to be elite on offense to uh, beat Nebraska. Uh, and then more, more than likely Houston in the second round, which by the way, I have a and beating Nebraska and then going to get into the sweet 16 by topping Houston. That what? is my pick. That's what I have. And we can mark it down because that's what's going to happen. All right, so the interview's over. You've already said it. You've got AM beating Nebraska. You've got AM beating Houston. And I assume you've got them beating Duke or I think Wisconsin, right? No, I have them beating James Madison because that's the way that they're going to be able to get through. Interesting. So we'll be going to Dallas. All right. Now, let's, let's, what about this Nebraska matchup you like in AM's favor? Uh, I like the fact that AM's defense is good and it's different. So, uh, the matchups, I feel, while Nebraska has a little more size, they play on the perimeter. And with the ability of Anderson Garcia to defend on the perimeter, the ability for Henry Coleman to defend on the perimeter, Solomon Washington to, to defend on the perimeter, and then still have that rebounding edge because Nebraska is not a good rebounding team. Uh, I'm not sure how good of a defensive team Nebraska is. I, I feel like they're solid, and but they don't force a lot of turnovers. They they don't make it hectic for, for their opponent. They're just a solid team, and uh, the ability for Wade to put pressure on Nebraska's defense, the ability for Boots to put pressure on Nebraska's defense. And, you know, Nebraska isn't a team that fouls a lot because they play solid defense, but I think A&M can force them into fouling. Uh, with their aggressive nature towards the rim, Manny getting in the paint, Boots getting in the paint, uh, Solo and and Anderson with with their rebounding ability and putbacks on on offensive rebounds. I think Nebraska is going to have to foul a little more than than what they're used to. It's going to throw them out of their game. Uh, there's 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 a, a lot of little facets that go along. Obviously, the biggest one is can A and M stop the barrage of threes that that Nebraska is going to shoot and and for the season, I mean, they've shot as a team 36% on the year, and they've shot almost 900 threes. And that's that's a lot of threes that that they've taken. And everybody thinks AM takes a lot of threes. Nebraska has taken 871 threes. AM has eight, taken 820 something threes. And, and so Nebraska has has taken a lot more threes than AM, and they've made a lot more. They've shot 36% as a team versus AM's 28% as, as a team. However, the last five games, I don't know what AM's percentage is, but I would I would assume that it's closer to 35, 36% as a team uh, from, from the three-point line. I'm guessing. I don't know. 
I feel like be, I feel like it's been stronger. Beyond Nebraska's ability to hit threes, beyond that, is there something that they do that does concern you? Yeah, they're very they're very calm, cool, and collected. They're a solid team. They, you know, in years past, we've talked about how a Buzz Williams team they go out and they do their thing and they force the opponents into their style of game, whether it is a fast paced game or it, it's muddy it up and play defense and, and grind it out. A&M has done that. I think Nebraska is a team like that. Uh, not so much focused on making it helter skelter and, and just, just making the game muddy. Nebraska is a solid team offensively, defensively. They do a good job and A&M is going to have to force Nebraska to get out of their comfort zone, play a little faster, Play a, play a little more scattered, and a and will, will win this game if they can do that. I feel that a and being a veteran team that, you know, some a lot of these players went through the NIT a couple years ago, getting to the final, a team that played together last year and was really good in the SEC and struggled there, obviously, in the first round of the SEC, excuse me, the NCAA tournament. That experience should trump uh, Nebraska, who may be a team that can score a lot but has not been to the tournament since – 2014. This is going to be completely new to them, while a and I think, is battle-tested. Well, when you, when you look at it, a and has been to the tournament 16, or this is the 16th trip to March in March Madness to the NCAA tournament. This is the eighth trip for Nebraska. Nebraska is the only Power 5 school that hasn't won an NCAA tournament game. And, and that's, you talk about the experience, a and having some veteran play in postseason. Uh, Nebraska does not have that for sure. That can be a double-edged sword. And they might be, they might be loose and enthusiastic and excited. And they just they have no recollection of what it is. So they're here. They're here to play. They've got nothing to lose. Uh, or they could tighten up. They could succumb to the pressure and and lay an egg. Hopefully it's the second one. If it is the first one, I still think if they come out loose and just firing up shots and, and playing well, I still think AM has the upper hand. I, I, I really do think that AM has a really good chance to, to win this game and go meet up with, with Houston in the second round. Well, um, let's talk a little bit deeper about that because Nebraska loves to shoot threes, and we, we've established that. AM gives up a lot of threes. How do you think defensively? Because we knew Penn State liked to do that last year as well, and Penn State continued to do it. What does A and M get for forty what, minutes what, against A and M? Yeah, I mean, and then A and M was doing it too, uh, but they were missing. What's the wrinkle defensively to force them to not shoot as many threes, Logan? I think where they have a, an upper hand in on the defensive end is the fact that Nebraska plays more they, they don't have that inside game just like AM doesn't have that inside game nebraska doesn't have that inside game and AM's bigs and we'll put in air quotes bigs because anderson garcia isn't necessarily one of the you don't think he, he's not a 6 11 guy that just sits in the paint uh solo isn't isn't a big guy henry coleman he's strong but he's not i mean he's 6 8 AM's bigs are mobile and i think that their bigs can apply pressure on the perimeter where, where, where other bigs across, across the country don't have that capability. And so they're going to they're gonna be able to force pressure along the perimeter more so than, than most teams that, that Nebraska has played. You, you apply that, and, and Nebraska's big man is, is he shoots threes. He's, I think he's, a, he's a, a, a Polish guy, or not? maybe not Polish. He, I don't know what country he's from. He, he's, he's not from America. He passes the ball well. If AM can apply pressure to him on the perimeter, one, he can't get his shots off. Two, he won't be able to move the ball like Nebraska is used to. And if you can stop the ball from, from going from side to side, cutting down on the reversals, AM doesn't get lost as much. You know, it's it's when they reverse the ball two or three times that A and M has to start scattering and 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 running for 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 help side defense. If they can maintain the ball on one side, which is what they try to do, and they can do that through the bigs, apply pressure on the perimeter to where they can't, uh, where Nebraska can't reverse the ball, that's going to stop all of Nebraska's offense. And that's where they have that's where they have that 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 edge on defense and. 
we talked about it. You mentioned it. A&M didn't adjust last, last year in postseason against Penn State. They didn't try to make them out of the game. They, they just tried to force their style of play, and that didn't necessarily work the entire time. You're not going to see this staff go into the same, go into this postseason with the same game plan of we're just better. We're going to do what we do. Now, I do think they're better, and I think do think they're going to do what they do, but they will have some wrinkles and some preparation, unlike they did last year. So I hate that I do this, but I do it, and I think we all do it. We look at Penn State and think Nebraska when they're completely different. Uh, you know, it, especially considering Jalen Pickett was a big, strong guard that was just a matchup problem for every guard outside of uh, Dexter Dennis. Right? Um, that's not how this Nebraska team is built. So when it comes to asserting your size and athletic will, I feel like AM has that advantage because if they put somebody on, on Manny, I think Manny's physical enough to get to the rim. Well, then Wade Taylor's going to be cooking. That's that's what I love about this AM AM team now. I mean, just in the last six games, you know, before that, a month ago, we were saying, well, they have trouble because all they have is 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 Wade shooting threes and and boots going to the basket. They didn't have that that third player in Manny to be playing the way he is and his, his growth and his development in the last two weeks, three weeks has been phenomenal. And that's the only reason that, that why, why A&M is in the tournament, you know, with, without his growth and without his contribution, they wouldn't be where they are right now playing. We wouldn't be having this conversation talking about Nebraska in the first round of, of March Madness. Um, in that Logan, isn't that the truth though, when it comes to like, you know, I, I know people have been critical about you know AM's success in the postseason these last couple of years, but one thing you have to give Buzz Williams is he'll figure out figure out a recipe that works for his team. And when you think it's time to hit the panic button or you think it's too late, they they hit you with a with a left hook. You know, two weeks ago on on air, we talked about how cool would it be if right now is the turning point, you know. Buzz always has his team make a run at some point in the season. How cool would it be if right now were the turning point to where they win the last two games and then they go and rattle off three or four games in the conference tournament and they're in March Madness and they're they're rolling. And we kind of said it not in a joking manner, but hopeful, like maybe yeah. this is it. Maybe maybe that that's what they can do. We're not sure if it's, it can happen, but at some point in the year, Buzz always has his team make a run. And they did make that run, and they're th this is they're still on that run right now, and that's that's why I feel like A and M can really make a run in this tournament because it's going to be tough to get na past Nebraska. There's no question about it, but I think they can do that if they play Houston. I mean, they lost to Houston by what was it three? Yep. I mean, they lost to Houston by three, and they didn't even have they didn't have even have Tyrese on the floor. And Manny wasn't playing the way Manny's playing now. So what's to say that they can't beat Houston at this point? Like they, they've, they've grown infinitely since where they were in, in non-conference play. Well, I agree with you, Logan. Where I worry about, because, you know, I worry. That's what I do. Is the fact that this team, and, and many teams do this, by the way. It's not just unique to A&M. They, they go in these droughts offensively. And, and defensively, too, by the way. That you know they were down by twenty plus against Houston. They were down by twenty plus against Iowa State. They came back and beat Iowa State. Uh, they were up by eighteen on Florida, and then their offense and their defense, you know, failed them. And then they ended up losing that game to Florida at the at the end of the uh, SEC tournament. And that's where I worry. I don't think you can take. There's a reason this team was nine and nine in conference play. They have found something that works now, so they're not that same team, but they are sometimes a little bit um, inconsistent. And and that that's all on coaching, you know. Uh, that 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 is that is the coaches have to find a way to make this team sustain the high level of play. And Florida, look, Florida's a good basketball team. I have them. I I wish I could have my. I wish I pulled up my bracket. I have them Sweet Sixteen, maybe Elite Eight this year, and. Just because I think they're a very complete team, they have a they have dynamic guards. All of them can score. They're athletic enough to play defense. But A and M had them down by by eighteen, and unfortunately, they did lose that game. But that's a learning point. That that's that is that's another 
learning situation for this team. And, and this is a new team. I, I consider A&M, the team that we're looking at now, a completely new team. Because the way that they're playing, we hadn't seen all of these aspects on, on offense. We hadn't seen this style of defense. I think their defense has drastically improved in the last three weeks of the season. And so, yes, it is a worry because there is much more data to show that they are very inconsistent. But because they're on this role, I feel like I'm confident enough to trust that they can they can maintain for the time being. And, you know, they beat Nebraska, they get to Houston. Houston's the number one seed. Who knows what's going to happen in that game? You, you, just, you just don't know who's going to show up. Is, is Houston going to have a game like they had against Iowa State and they can't make a bucket and they have, they have a number of different turnovers, unforced errors? You know, Houston can play bad too. I mean, they they lost they they beat Kansas by thirty. They lost to Iowa State by thirty. Like all teams have those issues. So in the tournament, it's win or go home, and you better show up. And if you don't show up, you're going to lose to anybody. I mean, we've seen it. Sixteen seed can beat a one seed, but you never think that's going to happen. But it's possible. Logan, back in the uh, preseason, if I would have told you, hey. Just so you're aware, Boots is going to miss some time and he's going to have a little part of the season where he's not as effective. Oh, and by the way, Henry Coleman's not really going to be in the starting lineup when the, when the tournament starts. He's he's good. He's coming back from injury, but he's not contributing. I don't think you would have believed the nine seed. No, not at all. Or throw out the fact that you say Jace Carter is only going to shoot mm-hmm. 25%. Uh, Wade Taylor is only going to shoot 28% or 30%, whatever he's shooting. Like I said, this team has no chance. There, there's, there's no way that that they're going to survive and they're gonna they're gonna advance. But they have they have found a way to put it together at just the right time. We all thought that this team was never going to make the tournament. If, if they lost one more game, this team, they, they, their, their hopes were shattered. Our hopes were shattered. And it was trending downward. And then all of a sudden. They rattle off five in a row. They play. They start playing outstanding. I mean, they they were playing really well. They lost to Florida. That's that that happens. But now they're in the tournament, and I, I it's it's a new team. It's a new season, and anything can happen. This team, I feel like, can beat anybody in the country, and that's what we've said all year long. If they're playing well, they can beat anybody in the country. But if they're not, they can lose to anybody in the country too, and that's. I think that's the that's the worry portion of of what what we're talking about right now. They can lose to Vanderbilt. They can lose to Arkansas. They they've proven that. It, it, it's it's Houston. You know, unfortunately, Houston lost to Iowa State by thirty. But Iowa State is one of the top top ten teams in the country, top fifteen teams in the country, and so that's a different level of loss. Logan, I'm embarrassed. It's ten eighteen or ten nineteen, whatever it may be, in the studio and. We haven't talked really about solo, and that's another, I think, tip of the cap to Buzz and his staff because the development that we see from players on his roster, um, and we talked about Manny, and Manny's been more lightning in a bottle recently in the last seven, eight games, but uh, solo, we always knew it was possible, but he's lived up to what we thought, and now he's a guy, an offensive threat as well, where I don't cringe every time he shoots outside. He can make them, and he can attack the rim. I was I was about to add, you know, at the beginning of the year, every time he touched the ball and he was going to shoot a three, I mean, I was trying to call timeout for Buzz. Timeout right before that shot fires up. Timeout. We don't want him to shoot that. Now, while he's not as consistent and you don't necessarily want to see him shoot four or five threes in a game, I'm okay with him taking his shot. I'm okay with if his feet are set and – He's open, you know. I I don't want him taking a a, a two dribble pull up with with a guy in his face. That's not what I want. But if he's open, whether it's short corner, elbow line, uh, free throw line extended, whatever it may be, and he's set, I'm okay with that. And that's where we thought he was going to be this year. I did think that he would have a little more. Uh, fluidity to him around the basket but 
he, he's still just a little raw. He's so dang athletic, though, and he's so intense at, at on every play, whether it's offense or defense. He changes the team's mindset just on his intensity alone. And that's what this team needs every single play from him. Logan, how pumped is Katie about uh, also the women getting Nebraska? Man, it's, it's awesome. Uh, you know, we, we were watching the selection show for, for the women, and right before Katie was like, I'm still nervous. I, I don't know if, if they're going to get in. They, they deserve it. But you know what happens on these selection committees, and, and sometimes everybody is, sometimes good teams get left out. Indiana State got left out this season for, on the men's side. But the, the thing is, they got chosen, and both of us, we were, we were actually in the studio. We were walking around, and we heard it on the TV, ran down the hallway, gave each other a high five. We were excited. I mean, that, that's, that's, we, are, we are intertwined in both men's and women's, and no matter how good or bad the season goes, we want these teams to succeed, and it is, it is such a good feeling to be part of March Madness. Uh, it's, it's just the best time of year. Logan, uh, I'm happy that Justin Lanham's here. He's, he's doing some of the uh, content for us. But I miss having you around at the NCAA tournament, buddy. We'll, we'll get together whenever I get back in town. Yeah, man. Hey, before we go, Joseph Jones' birthday today. Happy birthday, Big Joe. Happy birthday, Joseph Jones. Who was it? It was uh, Tom Schubert. Oh, you were listening because you, you sent out a, a response when yeah, you talked to, uh, to about Joseph about you. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's my college roommate. And uh, I definitely raised the bar when it, when it came to that household. I was not holding it back, unlike some other people, the big fella from Norman G. <laughs> <laughs> Logan, brother, you're the best, man. Thank you. Have fun up there. Let's, uh, let, let's get a couple wins and do this again. Yo, if you're right and they do win against Nebraska and Houston, are you going to go to Dallas? Absolutely. And there, there's really no if about it. I, I'm, I, I, I try to tell my wife this all the time. I am rarely wrong. I have been known to be wrong on occasion, but most of the time I am correct. So y'all might as well just, just mark it down, buy your tickets in Dallas, and I'll see you there. Hey, uh, I got, I'll, I'll leave you with this. Did you think A&M was going to beat Penn State last year? Actually, I did think they were going to win. But I think we had the conversation of, I am so nervous about Jalen Pickett because he yep. could dominate this game. And what did he do? He dominated. So are you not worried about Dominaga? So uh, I am. I am. But I think they're more worried about Wade Taylor. That's right. Thank you, Lolo. Appreciate you, brother. See you, Nuno. Around the SEC, then Billy Lucci to close out the show. Right now, Troubadour Festival time, a Texas barbecue and music experience. They return to Aggie Park on Saturday, May the 18th. And this year's event, bigger and better than last year's. It keeps getting better every year. Troubadour Festival bringing you together 35 of the best barbecue joints in Texas for you to indulge in unlimited samples of their incredible smoke creations. And you can't forget about the music. There's 35 country music uh, stars all over the place, including this year's headliner, country music icon, Travis Tritt. He's going to be joined by several other guys. Right? you got the Texas country legend, Pat Green, as well as William Clark Green, the Red Clay Strays, Cameron Saki Band, and much, much more. So if you want to experience the barbecue, yes, I do. If you want to experience the concert, yes, I do. Or just the concert itself, there's a ticket for you. Tickets on sale now at TroubadourFestival.com. That is TroubadourFestival.com. Get yours now. We'll see you at Aggie Park. And that's going to be, again, on Saturday, May the 18th at Aggie Park.
Welcome back into Tech Sags Radio. We are presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio here in uh, Memphis, and they are the official insurance provider of Tech Sags Radio. The difference is real. They're an independent insurance company built around educating you on exactly what you're paying for, doing the shopping for you so that you can accomplish all of your insurance goals. They got headquarters in Highway 6, or excuse me, in College Station on Highway 6. Call them up, 888 rollo or go to Rollo Insurance. Dot com. This roadshow brought to you by Alpha Paving. Let's go to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. Caitlin Torn is there with around the SEC. We've got eight teams in from the SEC in the NCAA uh, tournament. Caitlin? Yeah, we do. Let's run through those matchups really quick. They are all favored to win, according to ESPN, except for the kickoff game today. Mississippi State plays Michigan State. Um, they are the only SEC team that is not favored to win um, right now. But we've got two seed Tennessee playing St. Peter's tonight at 820. Three seed Kentucky plays Oakland tonight at 610. Four seed Auburn plays Yale tomorrow at 315. Four seed Alabama plays Charleston tomorrow at uh, 635. Six seed South Carolina plays Oregon today at 3. And seven seed Florida plays Colorado tomorrow at 330. All right, some good matchups out there. That's interesting because I saw a lot of Vegas there, Caitlin picking uh, Nebraska to win the game. And of course it's an eight versus nine Mm -hmm. seed. So to me, it's, you know, it's a coin flip when it comes to most of those, but most of what I read was that uh, Nebraska was favored to win. Good to see that uh, somebody watches the film. Somebody, somebody's rooting for us. Someone's on our side. What else do you have for us? We've got Cali actually had some interesting stats about the tournament from the SEC. Since 2016, none of the 17 SEC teams to earn a top four seed have reached the Final Four. Um, The only two SEC teams to advance to the Final Four since 2016 were number five, Auburn, in 2019, and number seven, South Carolina, in 2017. The last SEC team to reach the title game was eight-seed Kentucky back in 2014. Um, Tennessee, Kentucky, Auburn, and Alabama are all top four seeds this year. Auburn is 11-0 in first-round games in modern era and there's no other school without a first round loss has more than three wins let's see what All else right. do we have south carolina Anything else? sorry oh go ahead with south carolina oh. south carolina's in their last um in their last tourney appearance in 2017 they won four games as a seven seed to reach the final four but those are their only four ncaa tournament wins in the past 50 years Interesting. Very interesting. All right. Uh, appreciate that, Kellen. Thank you very much. When yeah. we come back on Texas Radio, Billy Lucci going to be joining us here. Sounds a little hollow in here. Nick, does it sound hollow on your end? No. No, David. no it does okay. not. Thank you. Also, we're going to be hey. calling Billy, by the way. He's not going to be in studio for us. So Okay. We Just will letting you know that. call Billy Lucci here next on Texas Radio. We'll talk football. We'll talk basketball. We'll talk baseball. We'll do it all here on the program. Right now, they're Heritage Films. That's Chance McLean's company. They make documentary films, a really cool thing that I think you should consider for your family. Um, honestly, guys, what an awesome treat it is to, like, if you want to do a really cool Mother's Day gift, a really cool Father's Day gift, or grandpa or dad or somebody very important in your life, how about getting them a documentary done? Now, you may be thinking, or they may be thinking, I don't need a documentary done. Like, why would I want to do that? Well, we want to keep the family name going, the family story going, right? Uh, No longer the game of telephone. How about getting that story on video uh, to be preserved for generation after generation, right? That's what Chance McLean and his team does there at Heritage Films. They tell people's family stories from the very beginning of the family through all the great times and even the difficult times. He does it with the video, the music, the pictures, all to match, and it is done in a Hollywood-esque type form. That is a Heritage Film, a two-hour documentary that he can do for just normal day people. That's one aspect. You can also do the Yearflix 20-minute video Q&A form for the youngers in the family. We're talking sixth grade. You want to tell that story about how this kid, this kid, your kid is into volleyball and also has got a really good best friend who lives down the cola sac and they like to do this Q and a form. Their favorite movie is this favorite actress, athlete, Aggie moment, whatever it may be. And then you follow up a couple of years from now, because these are benchmark videos and you ask the same types of questions to see how much they've grown. And then you follow up when they get to Texas A&M as a freshman, awesome videos and chance does those. YourHeritageFilm.com is the website, YourHeritageFilm.com, 
Well, welcome back into Tech Sags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio Roadshow, brought to you by Alpha Paving. Let's uh, got a lot of topics to get into with Billy. Let's go straight to the hotline. We're joined by our executive editor and co-owner of Tech Sags, Billy Lucci. Billy, good morning, buddy. Good morning, David. How are you, man? I'm good. How's Memphis? Keeping it warm? Keeping it warm, not bad, buddy. Like I was, I really like the area where we're staying. It's a part of downtown that's, you know, you can walk. You don't feel like you're in danger. It's, it's cool. We're having a good time. You're never in danger, David, but yet you're always in danger. That's right, buddy. You're never in danger. Physically, you're always prepared. Well, I'm, I'm definitely, you know, you saw that book that I have. I'm certainly getting prepared. Let me tell you something, friend to friend. It ain't going to help. You're still going to be worried about the apocalypse. Yep. The zombie apocalypse. But you know what? I'll know how to like start a fire without a fire, like without a lighter. I'll know how to do that. I'll be fine. <laughs> that, that will come in handy one day, I'm sure. Hey. Let's start off when you with, when you when you and Katie and Olin when you and Katie and Olin run out of gas driving back from Memphis <laughs> and it's freezing cold like some freezing temperatures where you can't make it without a fire and you like one outside the car they're going to be really happy you read that book. Yep, yep. I also know how to use a tourniquet and I'll know how to. Uh, all right, we don't need to get into that. Let's let. Can we go to football and we'll work our way to basketball? <laughs> I was kind of hoping to hear you say when you thought you were going to need a tourniquet, but let's, yeah, let's, uh, there's a hey, lot to discuss. Let me tell you right now, these, these books I've been reading, this is multiple, by the way, you need a tourniquet at all times. You never know. You might drive up on an accident and you can save somebody. I think and, I see, yeah, that, that's true. And I did see someone require the Heimlich at dinner last weekend in Memphis, and I won't say who, but one of them, the guy that administered the Heimlich was, was with us. Uh, he listens to the show. He's never missed the Tex Ags radio show. And um, he tapped him. I was sitting to his right. He didn't tap. Hey, Bill Slade, if you don't like what we're talking about, turn it off. I'm going to tell you like I do everyone. And I'll tell the guy working, at, everyone at Traditions, turn the show off right now. Sorry, you know, somebody texted me, harassing me. He said it was starting slow, so I built up. Anyway, our buddy had to give the Heimlich, and about halfway through, like a minute to two minutes in, when it's not working, I'm like, man, he really turned the wrong way and picked the wrong guy. He's asked him to come and save his life because this isn't going well. And our buddy was like, well, no one else helped us. I didn't know it was a two-man job. Like, once you stand up and start doing it, haven't you signed on for the duration there? Well, I got a different interpretation of that story for the record. I, I've, I've, been, I've been told, and uh, let's just say I can imagine that moment where, like, who's going to do it? What, some, and at, at least he no, stepped up to the challenge. Absolutely, absolutely not. That's not true. The guy turned to his right, tap, tap, tapped him, like, help, help, help. By the time I turned around, they were both standing up, and it took him, like, 35 to 38 Heimlichs before it worked. This poor bastard's probably got broken ribs. But he's alive. Billy, uh, but he's alive. Thanks, Kelly. Billy, let's talk about the schedule, the 2025 schedule that came out yesterday. What were your initial thoughts? Boring, boring, boring. Um, I mean, he, here's one thing you've learned is not to speak too soon about what a home slate in the SEC looks like. Yep. I sure don't think South Carolina will be very good. I sure don't think Florida will be very good. They might be breaking in a new coach. Um, Auburn's kind of an unknown, but, you know, they're behind, like, let's say, the teams, a lot of teams currently in the SEC. You might look up and you might be playing, depending on when you play them, you could be playing a top 10 Florida and Auburn team at your place. You could be playing a ranked South Carolina team. But it just doesn't have the appeal. So you hope a and M's predicted to be really good because that's really the biggest thing that matters. And look, it might be a situation where you look at the home schedule and a and M's formidable enough where you're like, we should run the table at home. Okay. That's a good starting off point. 
then you can start worrying about that, those road games. It was brutally tough on the road, uh, brutally tough on the road, particularly depending upon how Missouri can sustain things. I think they'll lose a lot after this year. They lost a lot after this past year, but how can they sustain things? Uh, will someone hire drink away? Who knows? We don't know those things, but Texas, Notre Dame, LSU on the road, uh, tough. No Bama, no Georgia again. 14 years in, Georgia's not. That's why the league needs to change to a better scheduling model. And I know what they're probably holding out for is they're probably just kick the can down the road one year or they're holding out for future potential future expansion. Um, they've got to add a ninth game. I don't care what the coaches say. I don't care. Like, it just it feels so ridiculous that, like I said, Texas will play Georgia twice in two years in the league. Texas A&M will play them once in 14 years in the league. And not that we care, but in 14 years in the league, A&M will never have gone to play football in Lexington, Kentucky. And they'll play Kentucky once. And they'll play Florida, like, by then, like, six or seven times who's in the East as well. So the thing's screwed up. It's wonky. It needs to be fixed. It's obviously not going to be fixed next year. It's wild to me that Texas not only draws Vandy twice in two years, their first two years in the league, but they're also going to have a pretty damn cake schedule in conference for their first two years. No Alabama, no LSU, no Ole Miss when they're up. No Tennessee. It's pretty ridiculous if you really look at it. And, and and they are getting a silver platter cakewalk into this conference that everyone's been telling them is so tough for as long as uh, as long as A&M's been in it. Meanwhile, if you're OU, I think you have the biggest gripe. Because look, at the end of the day, A&M doesn't get Ole Miss when they're up. They don't get Tennessee. They don't get Georgia or Alabama. So there are some positives to this thing as well. Me, though, I'm like, I want to see Bama on that home schedule. I want to see Georgia at Kyle Field. Uh, I, I'm, I'm already missing the annual game of Bama, if I'm being perfectly honest. He's only been lost like 10 out of 12 of them. Well, Billy, I think that's a, a great point because earlier on the show, OB was like, I'm. We, we don't need to be worried on who's the schedule. I just want to be the team that's the aggressor. I want to be better, not worry about who's on the schedule. They need to worry about us. Yeah, A&M under Mike Elko, the goal here is to be top 10 program in college football. And I know that, I know you, some people are going to know it's to win a national title. I get that. If you're a top 10 team in today's college football with a 12 team playoff, you're going to have cracks at it. If you're a top 10 program, and that's why I consider LSU. I don't consider LSU a top five program in football. I consider them a top 10. And guess what? They've won three Natty in my 20 years, 25 years, whatever it is. You can do it as a top 10 program. Um, so I, I think that's, that's what you're aiming for. And if you're there every year, then yeah, whether you're number one or you're number 15 or 20, you're worrying about playing Texas A&M because they're, Take more beating you anytime you step on the field. Billy, uh, basketball wise, we've been doing some research, and obviously, it's still the same storyline. Um, Nebraska shoots threes. A and M's a better rebounding team. We're going to hear from both uh, squads uh, later on today. We'll be at uh, the shoot around there uh, here in Memphis. But just when when you think about Nebraska, outside of threes, is there anything that worries you, or is it really about A and M dictating their 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 tempo and their will? I think what worries me is it is Nebraska shooting because we've seen A and M over the last, let's say, three years when they've been good tournament worthy team. Um, a lot of their worst losses have come when teams have been red hot and drilling open three after open three after open three and finding a weakness defensively uh, right up until that last game against Florida. Now I will say a lot of those Florida threes were contested. Um, they were just quite hot. Um, sure, when you get a guy that's averaging two points a game, he comes in and just starts getting buckets and hits for 20-something. But 
I think this is – look, I heard y'all this morning. It's like Nebraska's never won a tournament game, and you said, what's Buzz's record in the tournament? And Owen said, well, it's 0-1 at A&M. Well, we're talking about Nebraska's history, so why not keep it a buck, keep it fair, talk about Buzz's history? Okay, so it, unless you're talking about these specific teams, I'm more concerned with these specific teams. But I do think with A&M, if Buzz and the Aggies can get past this first game, I felt the same way last year. They can get past that first game. He has proven in his career and at A&M, with the one exception, you know, in the last three years or so being that that Penn State game, which again there are similarities here, Big Ten team that can fill it up from three. I heard Lanham talking this morning about the uh, you know the six seven two hundred fifteen pound guy, guy handling the ball. That's going to be a problem. Remind me a little too much of the Penn State guy last year, but the reality is, I think this is essentially a toss up game. We don't know which A&M shooting team is going to show up. So you can show me all the stats about how teams that, you know, A&M's under 30% three for the year will tell, tell Ole Miss and tell Kentucky and tell Florida about that. They've been shooting way better lately. Wade, Boot, Manny, they've been shooting a lot better lately, and hopefully that carries in uh, to this week. Uh, there are some things that I really like in A&M's favor. I like that they didn't have to play on Sunday. I like that they're playing on Friday. I like that you'd like to think they can have a rebounding edge here. That could, you know, I like, I like, I don't hate the the second round matchup. Against, I mean, if you're going to be an 8-9, I don't hate that matchup. So, we'll see. I mean, I think so much of it is not going to depend on how Nebraska shoots, but how A&M shoots. Because if the Aggies are hitting shots and it opens up those driving lanes for not just not just Boots and Wade, but maybe even especially Manny, he can get you, you know, 12 or 14 by slashing to the basket. I, I think the Aggies have a great shot. I think they'll win. If they're shooting well from the outside, that to me is a ticket to win. Now they can figure out how to grind one out where they have to, get to the foul line a ton and, you know, dominate the glass. Like, they can figure it out that way, but that's not optimal. I think if they're shooting well, I think Nebraska's going to have their hands full. I think Nebraska's going to hit their share of threes regardless, and that's that's how they both stay in it and if they win the game. So, so really, I, think, I really I like athletically – A&M's advantage there because I, I think they're going to struggle with Boots, physicality, and, and Manny's physicality. Yeah, I think so. And I think, like I said earlier, like what you really want to see them do is start carving into that Nebraska front court depth and get some guys, you know, drive at them, draw fouls, get to the line. Uh, that, that's their real winning formula. I just think when they're hitting shots, they're very – an A and M team that's hitting shots, we've seen it in the last couple of weeks. That's a team that'll be playing in Dallas the next weekend, and that's a team that I'm not sure playing like the likes of Duke, Florida, or Texas Tech, or somebody. I'm not sure that wouldn't be a less daunting path than they have this weekend if they have to go Nebraska and U of H. Um, it ain't much different. I'll put it that way. I don't think because because of the Nebraska matchup. I think those teams I just mentioned are better than Nebraska, but because of the Nebraska matchup and the threes and all that, I think there's a tougher path this weekend potentially than even next weekend. And I'm not saying if they get through this, they're a Final Four team. I'm just saying, man, an A and M team that is hitting shot can beat anyone in the country. Uh, you know, on a, uh, in a given 40 minutes. They don't have drop to. They don't Billy. necessarily do that, but they will. Do you? It looks like it's 10.50 from where I sit. Yeah, but we're running out of time. And then the show over at 11? Yes, sir, but we have a break to hit before the end of the show. Okay, well, you want to come back on the last two minutes? 
Sure, why not? All right, let's Sounds do like Billy Lucci next here yeah, on Tech Sacks Radio. Oh, on the road. Or- Tech Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio here in Memphis. Thanks to Alpha Paving. Let's go back to the hotline. Billy Lucci with us for the last minute 30 of the program. That's what we have. Billy, baseball uh, recently Let's showed go. some some pitching issues. That being said, the DNA of finding a way to win when it matters. Yeah, I mean, they're going to have to figure out the pitching. I mean, I, I, listen, you have to understand – if you watch baseball, how many ebbs and flows there are during a season. But obviously, Slosh and Max Wiener are still trying to figure out what's going to be best and who's going to step up. Billy, when uh, when will I see you? Awesome, buddy. Thank you very much, man. Safe travels. We'll talk to you then. Billy Lucci there uh, on the hotline. Appreciate his time. All right, guys. That's going to do it for Texas Radio here on a Thursday, right? Thursday? Why do I not know what day it is? That's weird. Tomorrow's Friday show. My thanks to Justin Lanham and Alpha Paving for uh, helping us get out here 
Obviously, all of our great guests, Olin Buchanan, our Nebraska insider earlier in the program, Robin Washett. We had Schloss. We had Bronny. Um, and uh, we had Logan Lee. Very pleasant conversation with Logan. That's going to do it for Texags Radio here on a Thursday. Keep it with Texags.com. About to go to the shoot around and the press conferences. We'll have all that coverage on Texags.com. Thanks so much for watching and listening. We'll see you mañana.